Okay, good morning to everybody in person and online. So we have invited uh, uh, master gardeners that are already in the program online. So we've got another audience uh, online as well, uh, Dr. Dienick. So when you do present, if, for the most part, if you could stay around this area, uh, feel free to walk around, uh, but sometimes talk into the, the, the camera right there. Um, a little housekeeping for those of you online, if you want to ask questions, go ahead and put them through the chat because that's going to be the easiest way that I can get those questions uh, to Jonathan during the Q&A. So either ask them throughout and we'll answer them at the Q&A or go ahead and ask them when we have the Q&A session, which is going to be every 45 minutes or so. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, welcome Dr. Jonathan Dienick, uh, a soil specialist at University of Hawaii at Manoa. He's also our department chair for the Tropical Plant and Soil Sciences Department. I didn't prepare much more of a bio than that That's because I'm going to let you do it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And okay. let me know when you want to load up, so I'll get you started. All right, so I have to stay right here. That's no, no, you're good, you're good. Okay, oh my kako. <laughs> yep, okay, so Master Gardeners. Well, I've been supporting the Master Gardener program for 20 years. And uh, a little story, last week uh, I was driving from Maka to Manoa, which if you know Oahu can be a challenge, right? Didn't used to be, now it is. And I got a call from my mother and she was saying, Jonathan, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to give the Master Gardener talk to the Oahu program. This is Master Gardener season, folks. <laughs> February and March. And she said, oh, Master Gardener. That's interesting, Jonathan. You know, I just, I was really helped by a Master Gardener recently. I won't go into all the details, but it made me think about this program and what a valuable role in the community. It's part of the mission of uh, a land grant university, right? To serve community. So thank you all for volunteering. You know, it's volunteer. And just to put it in perspective, my mother said that that master gardener really helped her um, with uh, some diseases that were messing up in her garden. My mother has trained me. I'll, I'll tell a little about other people who trained me, but she was the first. We grew up in Europe growing food and flowers. My mom likes flowers. We all like flowers, right? So my, my job as a little kid was to work in the garden. Any free time, everybody going skateboarding, but no, Jonathan, il faut venir dans le jardin, il faut travailler, toi. And one of my main jobs was going to the neighboring dairy farm. You know, in, in Europe, back in the 70s and late 60s, it was small farms, right? And they were scattered everywhere, everywhere. Right next door was a family dairy farm. My job was to get manure in wheelbarrows from the manure pile and bring it up to the garden. I don't know how many wheelbarrows of manure I spent with moving from that farm to us. So you'll hear me today speak about manure and all of his glory and, and value, my mother can grow anything. She competes with insects and pathogens like all of us. She never took one class. She never made one soil pH measurement. She just happened to, I don't know how she even got connected to Master Gardener. Nonetheless, she was my first teacher. And to bring it back around, she was helped by folks like you. So, okay. So, we can begin. Uh, I will take a moment to acknowledge a few of my important mentors because without them, I would not be where I am right now. And so, I think my first slide is to uh, to honor them. Some of you, yes, some of you. Some of you may know the gentleman on the left, if you were born and raised in Hawaii, and if you've been around for a while, it's Uncle Erika Nana on the left. Right? Milo'i, born and raised in Milo'i. And when my wife plucked me from 
the savannah of the Central Afri African Republic in 1991. She's from Nanakuli, Hawaiian Chinese. We were in Peace Corps. She said, I got to go home, Jonathan. I like Africa and I like Africans, but I got to go home. So when we came to Hawaii, that was one of the first gentlemen I met, Uncle Eddie, and he was growing taro up at Ka'ala Learning, uh, Cultural Learning Center at Ka'ala in Waianae. So somehow he said, oh, you poor holy boy, you need some teaching. And so he took me under his, his wing. And I learned Hawaiian from him. And I learned how to plant taro and think about taro and other indigenous crops and how things were done in the days of old. So to Uncle Eddie, I said, Mahalo Nui, because he gave many of us. Who, who's heard of Uncle Eddie? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Okay, look him up. Uncle Eddie Kaanana. He passed away in 2008. For 10 years, I was given the opportunity to learn much. Milo Lee, you guys know where Milo Lee is, right? Okay, so before I begin today, be sure to study your island. Know where the places are. Understand the climate of that place, the topography of that place, because if you do that little bit of homework, it's going to help you go a long way to understand how soils change on the island. Remember, today's a poo poo. <laughs> We can study soils for decades and still be lost. I think I'm lost most of every day. Every now and again, I see something. It's like, okay, I'm back on track. To the right is Dr. Goro Uehara, Kohala. Everybody know where Kohala is? Okay, good. He was born in the 20s, grew up on a sugarcane plantation in Kohala. And as if you know the history, it's not an easy life. Yeah, um, hard work, small school. And then he graduated from high school and he went to Oahu and he went to Manoa, got a degree in uh, soil science. Then he went to Michigan State, got his PhD and came right back to Hawaii. And from the, nine, I think 1953 until 19, I mean, until two, 2012, he was an esteemed professor of soil science at UH known throughout the world for his groundbreaking and very important contribution to looking at soils from a tropical perspective. From the global south, you think about soils in Tanzania, in Mali, Thailand. I think those soils are the same as the soils you would find at those great universities in, in the Midwest, Purdue, Kansas State University, these are the great programs of agronomy and soil science. No, there's soil in Kansas, but it bears very little resemblance to the soils of Ghana, Nigeria. So he devoted his life to studying these red, iron oxide rich tropical soils. And he was as comfortable with a Malian cattle herder or a Malian um, sorghum planter as he was with President Clinton. He spanned the whole range. I had the great fortune to be his student for my master's and PhD. So to Goro, I said, Mahalo Nui. And he never forgot his roots in Koala. Never. Always came back and shared with anybody the wonders of soil. So both these gentlemen opened up a whole new way of thinking for me as a sort of a vagabond, you know, 1991. I was a little bit crazy. I still am. Okay, so we honor our ancestors. Look up, Uncle Eddie. Look him up. Treasure. All right. Well, wait, before I get there, we're going to spend about three hours together. Poor you folks. <laughs> about three hours. I can talk for about eight hours, sometimes 12, but I'll spare you. Try to do it in three hours. Got a lot to cover. My main goal today is that when you leave this room, 
you will be able to look at this island. You'll think about rainfall. You'll think about the parent, what gave rise to whatever is found there. And you'll be able to uh, identify the salient differences of the soils that you can find on this island. That's all I can ask for. With that, you'll be able to at least know what you don't know and know something about these very unique soils. Um, this island has some soils that, that are not found too many places in the world. And you, you might already have a, 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 an innate feeling for that. There's some very interesting soils here. So I hope that I cultivate a curiosity in you so that you go off and explore it in a little more detail. I'll try not to be too technical, but remember, it's a science, right? Soil science. Ah, oh, we like to think about soil as, you know, the microbiome, all the microbes, yeah, but remember we use physics and chemistry and biology and microbiology and biochemistry to understand complex environment. That's my job today, to try open the curtain a little bit. Okay, so if you go to Auntie Google, yeah, hey Auntie, what is soil? <laughs> now you, we, we don't even have to go to the library anymore. Wow, what a tragedy. And you type in, what is soil? There you go. And you hit images, you know, you can hit that little thing, click image up there. And you'll probably see something like this, or it looks like this. It might not have the same colors, but it, it'll say, oh, yes, soil is 45% mineral, 5% organic matter, and the remaining 50% is void space, or the pore space, the pores between those minerals and organic constituents. Yeah? And then that void space is going to be occupied by air and water. Some soils are all water. Can you think of some where it's all water? The void? Hmm? Hydroponics? Uh, that's not a soil, right? I'm thinking, think about the landscape out there, the landscape, the natural landscape, and think about soils that that void space is 100% water. But it's the ocean. Pardon? The ocean. No, 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 Just think about soil. Marsh. Soil, marsh. marsh. Good, a wetland. That's the soil. <clears throat> There's soil there. But all the void space is water. Hmm, that's going to change how that soil behaves. Okay, any others? The ancestors purposely made sure that certain soils were flooded for at least 12 to 14 months out of the year. Why? The constant nutrients of the pests. They were growing caulo. Taro, right? Mmm, flooded taro. That's soil. The soil there, but the void space is all water. Mmm. Now, why does it say this is an ideal representation of an average soil? Whether you go to Mali, you'll see a lot of African countries named today. Uh, the mother continent. Or if you go to Gabon, all over the world, and you measure soils, the mineral, the organic matter, the void space, the amount of water, and you measure it everywhere, Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, you know, where, Ukraine, Pennsylvania, and you average it all together, you take an average. Scientists like to take averages, yeah? And what do you find? In, indeed, this is true, on average, if you take a volume of soil, any volume of soil, on average, this is the how it's proportionate, you know, how it's uh, separated into its constituent parts. Okay. Goro always told us, okay, Jonathan, we're not really interested in the average, though, are we? No. No, it's the exceptions. It's the exceptions to these rules that really are the key. And why I put this up first is because the soils of this island, Kiave or Moka, Moko Kiave, breaks every one of those rules. I love it. 
who was a rule breaker in this room? I grew up breaking rules. Oh, principal's office, Jonathan. Jonathan, she le directeur. Don't sweet man. So let me give you an example. If we go to Ninole, you guys know Ninole? Oh boy, we're in trouble. <laughs> anyway, it's up Hamakua, right? You need to drive up Hamakua. And you take a soil sample from Hamakua. And you do this sort of measurement. I want to know the proportion of mineral, the proportion of organic matter, and the proportion of the void space. It will not look like that. Nowhere near that. The void space could be as high as 80%. 80% void. Okay. The organic matter could be as high as 20%. That sounds really weird, right? Well, where's the mineral? Well, you see the clays, these are high clay soils. They're really weird. They're hollow. They have a lot of void. The clay, the mineral itself. Ah, okay. So the point being is, if you read this book, I see you guys have this uh, Master Garden program for California. I would be very careful on the soil section. Be very careful. Some of it will relate, but you might get make some wrong, wrong uh, predictions, okay? All right. What about if we went to uh, Kia Oh, It's down the road. Huh? huh? Man, you know, see, see here, uh, sand, silt, and clay as the mineral component. Let's, uh, don't worry about the pictures. You go down to those uh, lava flow soils. There's, there's soil, but it's really rocks, isn't it? When you think about it. Now, now you collect the volume of soil from there. Well, first of all, 80% of that volume is going to be rocks. 80%. Then of that volume, you know, to at least 20% is going to be organic matter. Yeah. Well, now let me let me let me let me step back a minute. Rocks are not soil. Rocks are not soil. So you've got to sieve out all the rocks and get anything that passes through two millimeters. And then you're going to find there's no clay, there's almost no silt, and there's some sand. What's the remainder? Organic matter. Now you look at those soils. Wow. Plenty of plants grow on those soils. You, you folks don't call them soil. You're, you're like, well, what is this guy talking about? That's not soil. But it is soil. Look at all the plant there. Oh, he, uh, and the tree fern and all of that. Think of this island 500, 600, 800 years ago. Those were all forests. All forests. Okay, so we're on for a nice, I hope I jostle some of you today. Like, set you a kilter like one. Oh, Boy, he changed the way I thought about these things. Yeah, that's my goal. Okay, so don't worry about the don't worry about the diagram. Doesn't really pertain to Big Island. It's there. When you go to California, you can think about this, or Vermont, <laughs> or Belgium. That's where I was raised. Belgians are crazy. All right. Now, sand, silt, clay. You've heard of that, right? Soil, silty loam, sandy loam, clay loam, right? Sand, silt, clay. Those are the mineral parts. That's what a soil is, sand, silt, and clay from the mineral perspective. But I, we already said that, wow, our, our young soils here are just lava flows with organic matter. There's, there's really no sand, silt, and clay there. It's organic matter, okay? Um. Everything is mixed up though in the real world, right? You don't separate out the pore space and the mineral and the organic. It's all one big jumbled mess, all mixed up, right? And you have roots in there. And remember, most soils are intimately connected to roots. There's, it's an intimate connection. So when we think about soil, we can't separate roots. They coexist. They're, they're together. And that's very important. Uh, many of our modern agricultural practices um, don't recognize that importance because after harvest, 
of the cash crop, what typically happens? Bear fallow, right? The land is left bare and nothing growing there. Well, that's not so good for the soil for many reasons. You want roots there. Holds the soil in place, keeps an anchor, right? Number two, it harbors biological life. It keeps the soil living. When there's no roots there, the soil goes dormant. Microbes like roots. That's their, one of their most important holly. It's their restaurant. It's where they go eat. So that's what soil looks like, right? Wow, all kinds of things. What's the take home message from this picture? Well, it's a complicated mess. <laughs> One, it's hard to disentangle all of this stuff. Too many things happening all at once. Western science likes to do what? Average. Control everything and have only one variable. Absolutely. Yes. And we use it. We have to, because we want to try and understand this complexity. But really, it's very difficult to, to study the whole. It's a system. It's a whole system. That's what makes it fun. Right? Makes it fun, okay? Take home lesson from this is okay. You can't see pore space there, right? But there's a this is a soil like uh, this is a this is a soil from Maui actually, Kula Maui, and it's very similar to the soils of Waimea. I hope you know where Waimea is. <laughs> Everybody know where Waimea is? Okay, cool. So you know those soils of Waimea. There, um, if you if you go to the little bit the wetter side of Waimea Pool Kapu, there's no Pool Kapu. These are quite deep soils, quite deep, and they're super rich. Man, this is if you think back 30 years ago in Pool Kapu and Waimea, it was mostly what vegetable farms, lots of them, cabbage, romaine lettuce, celery, broccoli. There's still some, but those farmers retired and they were so successful that their children went off and did other things, right? As often happens, often happens, that's a natural progression. Goro didn't stay in an agrarian lifestyle in Kohala. Once he got his education, boom, he went on, and contributed in other ways. Now, why I bring this up is, because this soil is just like that, and it's really rich. You try find a soil better than this soil on the planet and come show it. <laughs> come show. I, I challenge all of you. Uganda. Pardon? Uganda. Mm -hmm. Good soils in Uganda, I agree, but they don't have our soils in Uganda are nice and light and fluffy <laughs> and really high water holding capacity. No, we'll put them side to side, my good friend. <laughs> Bring me that vertisol from Uganda. I'm going to show you a map of Uganda today. Okay. What's the point? The key lesson to me is it's complicated. It's living. You can tell that soil is living, right, folks? How? The earthworms. Yeah, there's earthworm and there's roots. And then in that core, it's only about this big, in that core are more microbial cells than there are people on the planet. Many more. <clears throat> Billions of living organisms in that core. It's only this big. Take care of it. <laughs> That's rule number one. My mom always told me, take care of soil. You know what her rule of thumb was? Add manure. <laughs> Pretty simple. Has that worked well for human beings? Oh yeah, manure has been one of the most important soil amendments from, from the beginning of domesticated agriculture. Think about that. Okay, and then there is the big island soil. Now remember, the interesting things in life are the exceptions. Who cares about the average? Yay, you know the average. None of us want to be called for. You're just an average person, right? Then there's the big island. 
we have two kinds of soils we're going to talk about today. You're, you're familiar with some of them or one of them. You are familiar with them. The young lava soils, these are very young soils. Some are maybe only a thousand years old, 800 years old. They go up maybe 10,000 years old. Once the soil gets to be more than 17, 20,000 years old, it no, long, it no longer looks like this. That it's transformed. Why? So, you know what? Maybe, maybe you'll come back here in 20,000 years. Okay? You'll come back to Hilo in 20,000 years. And you go out to, to Pahoa and Keau. And, and you think that landscape will look the same in terms of it? Those are rocky soils, right? You call them rocks, right? You just say rocks. Remember, I told you they're soil. Yeah? Will, they, will they look the same in 20,000 years? No, those rocks will have all weathered away. What's that mean, weathered away? Go to dust. Okay, good. But let's be a little, let's clarify a little bit. They will go to sand, silt, and clay. Sand, silt, and clay, weathering, transformation, chemical transformation. They will go from rock to sand, silt, and clay in some proportion. However, now we find very unusual soils. They're mostly rocks. Only less than 10% of a volume is a fine fraction, what we would call soil. So 90% of the soil volume is not even soil calling it soil. This is why we call it soil. Of that fine fraction, that less than 10%, more than 50% of the fine fraction is organic matter. And we know some things about organic matter. Is that correct? Tell, tell me something you know in terms of soil. Tell me what you know about organic matter. Brings microorganisms. Yes. Yeah, that's always the first one, generally. Yes, it's, it harbors and feeds microorganisms. Uh, we said soils are living. Okay, good. What else about organic matter? Holds water. Holds water. A lot of it. It's a source of nutrients. Absolutely. So you can see now, even though only 5, 10, 8, 7% of the volume is fine, 50% of that is organic matter, which does all of these things that make a soil, right? Harbors micro microorganisms, holds water, supplies nutrients, okay? So we have a name for those soils. All of those rocky lands that you see, most of the time you just call them, it has just lava, lava rock. No, we call them Histosols. Sol for soil. Histo. Yeah, histo is the Greek word for tissue. Tissue. Oh, organic matter. So these are organic soils, but they're so unusual. When we think of an organic soil, we think of my friend Barbara here who told me that's a marsh or a wetland and it's mucky. Right? Black. Maybe a little stinky, right? That's what we think of when we say histosol. Michigan has lots of histosols. Ireland has lots of histosols. The peatlands of the world. We can grow all kinds of things on those lava, young lava flows. The forest has showed us it can support all manner of biodiversity. These lands were cleared in the 50s, maybe earlier. I don't know the, I don't know the, 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 the exact progression, of maybe the 20s or 30s. A lot of these lands were cleared around Hilo and down towards Ka'u. And what was planted? Sugar cane. And they grew a lot of sugar on these soils, quite a bit of sugar. Mm, okay. Hawaiians grew stuff in these soils. Yeah. The ancients, 
you know, 500 years ago in Ka'u, they were growing all kinds of dry land taro. How are they doing it? They just augmented that rocky soil with what? Yes. Organic matter. Maybe you've heard of this term, pa kukui. Huh? Pa kukui. Kukui, you know, right? The tree. Well, Hawaiian, that was a very important tree to Hawaiian. Many people just think, well, oh, the kukui tree was, was there to get the oil to make the torches or, or for hula. Very important for hula, halau, the kukui, light, right? Knowledge. But Hawaiians use kukui as the primary fertilizer. And pa kukui was they would take a, a, a kukui tree and maybe slice off a few branches with a bunch of leaves and they would dig out a pit and they just throw that thing in that pit. And they let it sit there for a little while. It would, what would happen? My friend over there said already, it would decompose. And then what would they do? They plant kala. Uala. Look it up. Pa kukui. How did I learn that? Uncle Eddie. Uncle Eddie. Yeah, ma. Yes. What is pa? Pa kukui. Pa. Yeah, what, what is pa? Not pa. 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 P. Pa. A. A. Yeah. Pa kukui. I have to look up what it means. Dude, you know, my language some days is good, other days, pa lele. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about those soils. But on the other end, a large proportion of the soils on, on this island are soils that formed in, in deposits of volcanic ash. These are the, you see all of the pu'u on Mauna Kea, the pu'u on Kohala Mountain. Those pu'u produce lava flow, but they also produce a lot of what? Volcanic ash that was deposited on the land. And those ash soils are typically at least 20,000 years old. They're older. Right? They're older. They've been around longer. And we're going to discuss quite a bit about those ash soils in a minute. Okay. So, let's, how are we doing, everybody? Amazing. Yeah. How are we doing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I get a little excited. <laughs> I didn't tell you. I grew up in Italy, too. But Italian, qui. Nessuno. Ma. Bali. A vino italiano buono. Oh, yes. I understand. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Yeah, it's been in Medellin. You know, my cousin, <laughs> Pablo. <laughs> All right, we're going to step back a little bit. Now we're going to get a little bit of foundation. Okay. Soil formation. Remember today, I, I said, by the time you leave this room, if I've done my job, you will have a, an ability to make a prediction. For this place, I predict this kind of soil. You think, think you're going to be able to do it? Can anybody do that right now? My friend in the back, he's going to help me a lot. Say, What's your name? Roy, my no, guy, Roy. No, 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 okay. <laughs> okay, good. All right, now, so we need to talk about how soils form. Okay, so how do we go from a lava flow? Here in Hawaii, these lava flows, you know, the, these recent ones that came off of Mauna Loa last year, they're now no longer red, right? What happened? They crystallized. And they're now... Uh, Right, ah, uh, ah, uh, or ohoy, yeah, okay. And I, you know, I don't know if that was ohoy, hoy flow or ah, uh, uh, flow, but what color is it? Black, blackish gray, right? Blackish gray. So it's a rock. What kind of rock is it? Glass, pardon? Glass, glass is something that's blown in the wind. Basalt, basalt, yes, basalt, 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 basalt. that's the rock. And basalt has minerals in it, primary minerals. Olivine, you see it there, the olivine, that greenish olive color, has pyroxenes, that's the black crystals, and then it has calcium plagioclase. It's pretty hard, huh? Pretty hard. But when you put it on the spectrum of rock types on the planet, 
Basalt is the e most easily chemically transformed. It's the most susceptible to weathering. It's most easily transformed from a rock to a soil compared to granite, for example. You've heard of granite, right? Granite is a very hard rock. It is pakikira one. It doesn't want to change. It's going to stay rock for a long time. And when it does weather, it's going to form sand more than it's going to form clay. We're on the opposite end. Our rock very quickly forms clays. And the ash that came out of the volcano at the same time that you had the lava flow is even more susceptible to weathering. It will weather quicker into soil. Good. So, very quickly. You guys have tests in this class? Oh, yeah? Invention. <laughs> Who makes the test? We do. They're open book. <laughs> open and they're open videos, so they can just win the rewatch. Maybe you're lucky I'm not making a test, huh? <laughs> but I never had one of your classes. <laughs> but, uh, Actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, he's one of our good students. We have good memories of us. Okay, so here are the five factors. It's agreed upon whether you go to China or you go to Australia or you go to Gabon or you go to Colombia. People who study soil all agree. Yes, here are the five soil forming factors. Okay. Parent. What's the parent? Where it started, like the lava or the cool. ash. Good. Ash or rock here on the big island, but there are other parents to soil. Earthworms? That's the transforming agent. Well, that's rock. The other parent that I don't, I don't want you to forget is organic matter, can be a parent, can be a parent. Okay. All right. Age. How old? How long has that parent been exposed to these other factors? So time is an important. I've already mentioned time to you folks. I told you if a soil, if a, a landscape is younger than 15,000 years or 17,000 years or 12,000 years, what would you expect to be dominant on that landscape? Here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, let's think from the, the substrate. Oh, rock. Rock. I told you, there, there's soil on those Ohia forest lands, but it's 90% of that soil is rock. If the soil is over 20,000 years, 30,000 years old, 50,000 years old, what do you expect? Sand, silt, and clay. Some proportion. Why? Weather. Weathering. Hey, my guy. Hey, Vermont. Hey, Vermont is in the house. Yeah, my. Okay, good. So, age. So, weathering now. We just talked about weathering. What's the primary weathering agent on the planet? Whether you're in Uganda, rain, rain. water. Water is a very powerful molecule, very polar, a very negative side and a very positive side. And that water can do very interesting things to crystals. Hydrolysis, for example, break it up, okay? Temperature, a chemical reaction will proceed more quickly or more slowly as temperature increases. Right, so warm, wet places promote weathering or decomposition. But in our case, we're talking about the transformation of rock to sand, sand, silt, sand, and silt, and clay. If it's warm and wet, that process is accelerated. Okay, good. We're gonna come back to this water thing over and over this morning. In fact, you're gonna tell me, shut up, John. <laughs> you said it already. But remember, we learn by repetition, yeah? Who's a musician here? 
Yeah, you got to keep playing it over and over and over and over. And then finally, it just comes second nature. Okay. Biota. What is that? Biota. Living, Living organisms. All of them. From the earthworm to the root to the lichen to the microbe the fungi, all of those living organisms participate in soil formation in one way or another. For example, lichen. Lichen are pioneer species on new rock. Lichen are, are they're not, I, they're, they're in the plant kingdom, but they're quite unusual, yeah, quite unusual. And these guys, as they're metabolizing, they're producing organic acids. Right? And those organic acids are doing what to the rock? Breaking it down. Dissolving it. And as it dissolves, these are the beginning stages of soil formation. Yep. We call them pioneer species. We think about Ipuka. I think you guys can need to go take a Hawaiian class. <laughs> kipuka. You heard that word, Kipuka? And yeah, you heard it in what context? Areas that were not covered by law. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh. Or areas that somehow life began begins there. Yeah. Like a like a oh he is quite a quite a remarkable tree, is it not? You always look at early young lava flows, some of the early larger plants to, to pioneer on a lava flow is the ohia tree. And what's it doing? Its roots are producing organic acids. Those acids are dissolving. dissolving the rock. So right around where that little ohia tree, remember ohia tree grows slowly, but as it's growing, it's forming soil. As it's growing, beautiful. Topography. Okay, we all know what topography is, right? Relief. Topography has a very important role here in Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, it's interaction with the atmosphere. As you increase elevation in the Hawaiian Islands, what happens? Higher rainfall up to the inversion there, right? Maybe seven, eight, nine thousand feet, seven thousand, eight thousand feet. Then it gets dry again, right? So that we call that orographic rainfall. So now you can you can already begin to think about okay, the lower the elevation, we expect lower rainfall. It's not always a hundred percent true because Hamaku is a bit of an exception. Water movement. Topography affects hydrology. You can think about depressions. In a depression, what does water do? Yes. It gathers, it ponds, it, it doesn't drain as well. That, that changes the chemistry, changes the chemistry. Steep lands, water does, it moves. And as it moves, what does it do? It takes things with it. Okay, so those are the hydrology components, yeah? You can see how interesting this field of study could be, yeah? Wow. You can study all manner of sciences with soil as the study component. Is that a part of, well, I don't think so after what you were talking about, the geology? Well, geology, they don't, they, they get all the soil, move it all away, and geologists study the rocks. Hey, Jonathan, get that soil out of here. We want to see the rock. So where does soil fit in? Ah, soil comes from the rock. <laughs> so it's interesting, you know, our geo our geo our ge I have good relationships with geologists because they think I'm completely crazy. <laughs> good to be crazy. Okay, let's keep going, Jonathan. Don't get too out. Uh, and now we, we it's not just these factors. You can already see that's quite complicated. We're talking about five things that are interacting in all kinds of ways. Interacting. How do you disentangle that? It, it can be a big mess. And in fact, we're still trying to disentangle it. 
Okay. The other thing we have to consider that is a key part of how soils form and why one is different from another is these four processes, additions. One of the most important additions to the landscape that drives soil forming processes would be? Organic matter. Organic, well, before organic matter, water. So rainfall, how much, how often, okay? Organic matter, yes, important addition to the landscape. Somebody man mentioned Lus. I think it was my friend Mona. He, where, where, didn't you say Lus? Somebody said Lus a minute ago. Well, I heard Lus. <laughs> I might be imagining things. That won't be the first time. <laughs> Lus, you heard of Lus? No. No, anybody? I don't know what the- Aeolian? L-O-E-S-S. Yeah. L-O-E-S-S, -S, correct. Lust deposits. Yeah, this is this is the transport, aerial transport by wind of dust that goes from one place and settles in another place. That's an important addition. Yeah, you think of you've heard of southern China. You've heard of this word kaolin, China. You know the the fancy porcelain. Yeah was pride, the British, you know, they went around the world conquering everybody. I don't know why, but yeah. And, and they found in, in certain parts of China, these vast lust deposits that had pure kaolinite, which is a clay mineral, white. And it's perfect for ceramics. Who's a, who's a potter here? You've heard of kaolinite then, right? That's a very, it's a key ingredient for pottery. The lush deposits of southern China are rich in kaolinite. Soil can be formed from things transported from one place to the other and added. Okay? Transformation. We've already talked about a transformation process in soil formation. What is it again? Changing from one matter to another. Yeah, and, 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 we, and we, we gave it a name. We started with W. Weathering. Weathering. Weathering, chemical weathering. Chemical weathering transforms primary minerals or rock materials into sand, silt, and clay. Okay? Translocation. Things move within the soil profile. Losses. Things are both lost at the surface, but more importantly, for today's understanding is losses vertically. What's the agent? Water. Water. And we call that leaching. Heard of that word? Leaching? And though what's being lost? Nutrients. Nutrients. Silica. The soluble components. What remains? Iron. Aluminum. Titanium. Okay, Woo! you can see how a soil science, uh, a path on the, the line of soil science goes for years and years and years, and we rethink these things, sometimes in our dreams. Okay, <laughs> now, all right, bear with me, but this is a really important map. First of all, it's the globe. I love the globe. Let, let's think about it. My good friend over there, I can't see your name tag, but what was what, your friend? My friend there? Yes, you. I'm nobody. <laughs> no, you said Uganda or Jacqueline. Jacqueline. I want to go to Uganda right now. Okay. Can everybody pinpoint Uganda here? Well, Uganda is right around, <laughs> right around here. See that? That's Uganda. You see, it's got a blue. So, that's a lot of, that's thousands of square kilometers in one kind of soil. And she said, I said, the soils of Kula and Waimea are the best soils in the world, and you name one that's better. And what did she say? She said Uganda. She's not far off. I'm still going to argue with her. <laughs> but let's look. Blue. Okay. So let's see where these blue soils exist. Okay. We've got Eastern, this is the high, the rift, the rift zone, right? Oldavai Gorge, the cradle of humanity. It's a rich place. 
rich, biodiverse. Okay? Let's look at other places where we have this blue soil. Central India, the Punjab, Australia, yeah. all pretty diverse. Okay, what soil type is that? It's the same. If you go to this part of the world or this part of the world or this part of the world, it's called a vertisol. Vertisol. It's that vertisol. Vert comes from the word invert. <laughs> invert. Well, my little house, uh, Kipuhi Point, on the west side of Oahu, is on a vertisol. And as my daughter was growing up, she getting, they get more observant, yeah? Every year, new surprising things come out of their mouth. Hey, yes. How come you can't close your door? Hey, good question. Isn't that bad? I said, why? What people are going to come steal from? Hey, Mayalani, what are they going to steal? Mm -hmm. Books, <laughs> your old guitar, your old stove. Okay, so you see? Now, back to your question. Why can't we close our doors? Why, why not? Settlings. Well, all the door frames are cut. Oh. Up. <laughs> you can't close it. Why? Sadly, that soil inverts itself. When it gets wet, it swells up. When it dries out, it shrinks. And if left by itself on its own, it will invert itself. It churn, it's a churning soil. Vertisol is black in color when it's wet, gray when it's dry. Super rich in nutrients. So my friend Jacqueline, Jacqueline was it? Was right. These are fertile soils, but I don't like them. Why? They invert themselves. <laughs> when they're wet, I drive my tractor into them. I'm stuck. I got to come back a week later to try to get my tractor out. So sticky. You'll never get stuck in a white man's. <laughs> <laughs> never. Never. Ah, I remember Goro. He was my best kumu, right? I said, Jonathan, which soil would you like to our class? Hey, you guys, which soil would you prefer? This rich vertisol with high nutrients or this red oxisol with no nutrients. Oh, Dr. O'Hara, the vertisol, of course. <sighs> You're all wrong. You won't be able to grow anything in it because you'll only be able to go in and till it for 24 hours. They call them 24 hour clays. When they're wet, they're too wet. Can't work them. When they dry out, they're like concrete. Hard like rock. Okay. Now, I'm not gonna, Focus, but now you can see what 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 is common to these areas. Think in terms of those five soil forming factors. What would be common? Well, anybody been to Central India, Punjab? Good go. Good go. I, I did a lot of peregrination travel when I was a hippie back in the days. Yeah? And uh, dry there, but it has a distinct rainy season, very distinct rainy season. The monsoons come, drop a lot of water for three months, and then it's dry. Same, same with this part. And similar to these parts. As you go more north, it gets much wetter. So climate is similar. Rainfall distribution, okay? There are other things that would make it that vertisols would form there, okay? So now we're gonna take a couple of examples and look at how these soil forming factors influence what kind of soil you might expect there. Now you can see there's some kind of order to this. Each color is a different soil type. Each color is a different soil type. A mollusol, for example, is green color. Mollus in Latin means soft. Soft. Oh, so a soft soil. Is that preferable? Sure. Roots would like a soft soil. Okay. Let's look at mollusols. You can see where they're distributed, right? 
on the planet. Now, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is if you have a mollusol and you're, let's say, in Saskatchewan, you see Saskatchewan up there, or you're in um, uh, somewhere in, in um, uh, Western Argentina, yeah, or you're in um, Azerbaijan or the Ukraine, the soil is going to have the same fundamental properties, no matter where you are there. Why is that? Well, what is common to these regions of the world? Rainfall distribution. Yeah, you have wet periods and then you have a drier period. It's not wet all year long. Okay, good. What else is very common? Imagine 10,000 years ago. We've changed our planet, so today it may not be there. 10,000 years ago, if you were to get launched by a catapult and landed here, or landed here, or landed here, or landed here, what would you see on the landscape? Grass. Grass. Was that you? Yeah. <laughs> What's your name? Alex. Alex, mahalo. <laughs> exactly. Grass. These are the great grasslands of the world. Remember, biota is a soil forming factor. Oh, so grasses must have some interesting interaction with the substrate to form a similar soil. Well, grasses, who's familiar with grasses? You guys dig up grasses? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of root systems do they have? They have huge fibrous root system. Lots and lots of roots. And those roots are de depositing organic matter all the time. So these soils in the A horizon, the surface horizon, are going to be enriched in organic matter, which makes them soft. Organic matter is light. It's going to make them dark in color. I have another chicken and egg question. I mean, did the grass seeds evolve there because the soil was right, or did they create the soil? Well, that's a very good question. So it's the, it's the same sort of thought process that one might used to look at these young lava flows here in Hawaii in a wet area, in a very wet area, Pahoa. Yeah, oh, what kind of plants are favored? Trees, trees. In seasonally wet and dry landscape, what plants are favored? Grasses and shrubs. So, okay. It is a chicken and egg, but certain climates and landscapes promote certain plant communities. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, we, we, might, we might need a bowl of ava, <laughs> and we, then we inu and have a chat. Good. <laughs> so let's keep it uh, keep it as simple as possible. I like exceptions, though. There are always exceptions. Nonetheless, these grassland soils share similar properties, and we can classify them into one soil, mollusol. Okay, other grasslands can be other soils. That's true, but these mollusols are characterized by a few things. One, high organic matter. Doesn't matter where you are, Saskatchewan. Okay, they have to meet a certain amount of organic matter. Number two, high base saturation, which means lots of calcium, lots of magnesium, lots of potassium, okay? Number three, moderate weathering, moderate weathering, in between weathering, okay? So they're not rich in oxides of iron and aluminum. They haven't lost their juvenile characteristics. They're teenagers still, yeah? Okay, They're, they can be deep or they can be shallow, depends on the landscape. But wherever you go there, they're very fertile. High fertility, high fertility. Makes sense. We look at now large agricultural exploitation. Where do we find it? 
where you see those green soils. Look at the Midwest of the United States. That landscape has been completely transformed from its original prairie to acres and acres and acres of food. Why? They are perfectly suited to produce food. Oh, they, they'll produce food much past you and your children and their children. Oh, yes. They've been growing food there for a long time, and they will continue. I can assure you. Yes. Good. <clears throat> that does not mean that they're treating the soil as best as they should. That's another question. Can they do better? Of course. That's our job, though to work with farmers and explore alternatives. Remember, farmers, they have a tough job. It's easy to sit here and say, hey, and then go Costco. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so interaction of climate and vegetation produces a certain kind of soil, okay? Let's bring that to, to this island. Do we have- to take a break at some point. Oh, sure, sure, when do you want? Oh, uh, whenever you think it's a good. I told you, I go three hours. Yeah. But if you want to take a break, let, let, let's wait a little bit before we break. Okay. Cool. A little bit. All right. So. Oh, wait a minute, John. Yeah. Okay. So why are they concentrated around the same latitude to reconcile? That has well, nothing to do with soil. And Jonathan, would you repeat the question just in case online they couldn't hear so it? So my friend, uh, Ross, Roy. Roy, in the back, I got the first two letters right. <laughs> my friend in the back is saying, how come these green soils are concentrated at the same latitude? For the most part, there's a couple. They are, they are. And latitude drives what key? Weather. Climate, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have distinct seasonalities, number one. In the summer, it tends to be relatively dry in many of these places. I mean, the, the northern Midwest can get a lot of rain. Yeah. It promotes grasslands. So you'll get similar erosion and whatnot. And again, going back to evolution and the plants that adapted to that. So going back to the chicken and egg thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, it's not anything geological why they happen. No, no, because they're all different parent material. Because it's spray. So so remember I said that those five soil forming factors interact in complicated ways. In some places, one factor may be more important than the other. Okay. All right. Let's not get too stuck on this because we got to get to the big island. <laughs> what I wanted to do, though, is to give you some confidence that those five soil-forming factors can be used to explain soil diversity at a global scale. So I'm going to pick one more soil, one more soil, and then maybe we can take a break. But you know me, I go all the way to noon. Okay. That's the equator. Okay. Well, what do we know about the equator in terms of weather, climate? Hot and wet, very wet. Year-round rainfall, year-round warm temperatures. What do we know about the vegetation, especially in this area, even down to here? Jungle, Amazon. Okay, that's the Amazon. What's this, the Congo Basin? Okay, what's the vegetation? Rainforest. Rainforest, tropical rainforest. Okay, lots of trees, not much grass. Okay, even down here, a thousand years ago, this was all forest. It's not anymore, it's all soybean land. Brazil now, I think, is the largest producer of soy in the world. The largest. Okay, what is what ties these soils together? It's the same soil, oxisol. Isn't this all one land mass? Many, 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 many. Sure, sure. But let's let's think about the five soil forming factors. Let's think about the five. Let's go back to the five soil forming factors. So climate is similar in those areas. It doesn't change whether you're in Western Colombia or in the Congo. Yeah. So climate, hot and wet. Yeah. Heavy rainfall, talk about leaching. Heavy rainfall, lots of leaching, lots of weathering. So the soluble constituents, calcium, silica, are going to be removed, right? Because 
rainfall exceeds evapotranspiration. So it's the balance of the water balance there is going through the soil profile all year long, and you're losing it. What remains? Well, we're going to get to organic matter in a minute. Oxides of iron and aluminum. Oh. Iron oxide is a clay, hematite is a clay. What color is it? Red. red. When you dig down into these soils, they're red. Why? Iron oxide. Okay. Iron oxide has almost no nutrient holding capacity. It can't hold nutrients. Okay. All the nutrients just bypass it and leach out. Okay. Hmm. So, Aluminum oxide, same thing. Gibbsite, can't hold nutrients. Uh, Guttite, limonite, these are all the oxides of iron and aluminum. Very low fertility. Wait, Jonathan, you're telling me these are low fertility soils, but they have these huge forests, so much plant diversity. It's all beautifully green. What's going on? That red subsoil is not supplying nutrients at a high rate to those growing trees. It's holding water for them. Where's the, or where's the nutrients come from? Oh, there is no nutrients. Organic matter. These soils build up organic matter in the surface. But unlike the mollusol, the subsoil is infertile. The mollusol, the subsoil is fertile. It's fertile all the way through. Why is the subsoil infertile? Everything is leaching out. But remember, organic matter, like Roy said, supplies nutrients. Organic matter supplies water. Organic matter feeds organisms. So it's the organic rich favorizing that's maintaining fertility. Okay. So you can see now that weathering and losses and its interaction with rainfall is very important. Okay, so we're going to go to the Big Island now for a minute. And then if you really need a break, I'll give you a break. <laughs> okay, how do I go to that? I got to do something here, but I don't got my glasses. Okay, I don't need this guy, right? I can close this guy out. Yeah, here we get to there. Good to go again. Okay, all right. So we're coming, you recognize, huh? Big Island, you recognize. What's this a map of? Rainfall distribution, okay? So blue, very high rainfall. Red, very low rainfall. And you can see it's pretty, you can understand this, right? Where the train winds coming from? The Northeast. So they're coming, they hit Mauna Kea and Kohala Mountain, and what do they do? They drop all the rain. And it's been doing that for thousands of years. There are fluctuations in climate, but it's a wet place. It's been wet for a long time. What kind of environment is that? Leaching environment. Leaching environment. Okay, we've, we've learned something about leaching and soil, the relationship. Okay. As you move leeward, it's dry. Okay. All right. So, and it's a very distinct. Very distinct, you know, here up in, um, this is this is the Waimea area, right? Very quickly, you go from pretty wet to really dry, very quickly. You might think it's wet because it's, it's foggy, but there's very little actual leaching. It's not pouring rain like on the Hamakua coast, right? It's just like that cool, misty, yeah? So that's going to have an effect on soil. You can already predict. I bet you if I have, I won't put anybody on the spot. But if, if you were to tell me everything else held constant, where would you expect the fertile soils? Where would you expect fertile soils? Transition? In the transition, right? You see this transition? In this track, you need water to weather. If you don't have enough water, you can't weather, you might just have rock. Okay, so you need that beautiful balance of enough water to weather 
but not so much water that you're leaching. So I like Jacqueline. Hey, pay attention, huh? Jacqueline, she's on. She's on a roll. It's, ooh. I can already tell. Oh, my God. She's gonna, she's gonna be hey, we should go to Uganda together. <laughs> have, have you ever had banana beer? No, oh, I love some. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Pahala. Here. Who's been to Pahala? It's a beautiful place. And if you go and look at those soils, go find me a better soil in the world than the soils of Pahala. Go on. <laughs> Transition. You see? That yellow means just enough rain, but not too much. You go up, not not too up, not too far from this transition, and it's too wet. And what's happening? Leaching. Okay. You guys need a break? Okay. Oh, <laughs> 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 you get some breakfast too. Huh? I came all the way from Macau. <laughs> I gotta make sure it's worth my time. Huh? Well, you're fine. Take a break. Take a break. Right, about five minutes, folks. Not a good for all the same class. <laughs> Yeah, I got silly questions. Yeah, yeah. never. No, this is what exactly. Yeah, now it's there. Right. 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 Right.
friends. Ooh, we're going to continue because otherwise we won't get very far. And remember, when you leave the room, I need you to be able to make some predictions. Okay. All right. So climate distribution, I mean, rainfall distribution is, is very important. Um, we don't necessarily pay too much attention to temperature because where the soils are, the temperature varies a little bit, but not hugely. You know, where it's very cold on the big island, is there soil? No soil. At the summit of Mauna Kea, there's no soil there. Those parent materials are the same age as the Hamakua coast. Hamakua coast, you have deep soils, but up at the summit, no soil. Why? It's cold and it's very dry. Every now and again, you get a dusting of snow on these winter storms. But if you measure the rainfall in terms of inches of precipitation, it's very low. So what does that tell us? Weathering is slow. So the transformation has not begun. Okay, makes sense? Okay. All right, we're gonna move forward. Okay, uh, Kay is saying, uh, doesn't wanna move forward. Okay, go forward, do something. Come on. So just click on the- Just the, click on Just click on it. As you can, uh, yeah. and then you can go. Okay. Okay, just to reiterate, you have leaching environments and non-leaching environments. And that's important because leaching and abundant water accelerates weathering and accelerates losses. So we would expect where we have high rainfall, more soil, if the age is above 20,000 years old, right? And lower fertility lower fertility, why? Because those soluble constituents that are plant nutrients, calcium, magnesium, potassium, are leaching out, okay? So in these areas, we have nice soil. It's really nice soil, but the bee horizon, the subsoil is quite low in fertility. Where is the fertility in that Hamakua soil? in the A horizon, the surface layer. But remember, for several decades, that surface layer took a beating from sugar cane and organic matter was lost. Does that mean that's the end of that soil? Absolutely not. The guinea grass grew in and the guinea grass has done good things for them. I know you guys don't like guinea grass. <laughs> But from, from a soil regeneration perspective, it's building organic matter back. So, so don't, don't poo-poo it too bad. <laughs> no, no, no. If you're a cow and you have young guinea grass going, the new shoots, that's an excellent forage. You guys eat meat? Okay, you can raise good cows on that guinea grass. All right. Now, there's another thing that I haven't mentioned yet that's quite important. We might as well say it because we're going to be repeating it again. And then maybe if you haven't kicked me out by then, we'll um, measure some pH. We'll do some pH measurements. So you see that? Acid pH in the highly leached soils. So the base forming carbonates are gone. And you have acid forming aluminum. And those soils are naturally acid, regardless of sugarcane. They're acid. Why? Leaching. In the drier zones, you have near neutral to alkaline soils. So pH is from six to eight. A fertile soil for vegetables, we would say should have pHs near six or six and a half. Okay, so we have another term we've introduced here and we can relate soil pH to what? Rainfall, where it's wet, you expect acid. Where it's moderately wet with dry or dry, you expect near neutral to neutral soil. Okay? All right, let's keep going. We're, we're like building a house. We started, we started the foundation and now we're, we're coming up. How, how's it feel? How's the foundation feeling? A little shaky, but getting there, yeah? Okay, same 
soil types that you saw on that global map here mapped on this island. The area that's other that shows no color, what is that? That's either lava flow or cinders. No soil is formed yet. Not formed yet. Makes sense, right? I mean, think down here. You know, wait, these are all new, brand new lava flows. Okay? Brand new. No soil is formed yet. This is all, this is Mauna Loa. Very young. Very cool and dry. No weathering. Rock or cinders. Kona coast. Lava flows. Okay? Too young. No time yet for soil to form. Come back in 500,000 years. <laughs> okay? All right. The dominant soil on this island is that purple color. What, is it, what does it say? Andesol. These soils were first mapped in Japan. First mapped in Japan and named by Japanese soil scientists. They don't say andesol, they say andosol. I don't know why it got changed. Hmm. What might be similar in Japan in soil and the Big Island? Volcano. Okay. So uh, Fuji, all these various volcanoes produced a lot of ash. Ash. Ash blanketed the landscape. Rainfall and weathering occur and transform them into a class of soil we call endosols. Endosols. These are soils formed in volcanic ash. Volcanic ash is different from lava. Lava is crystalline. The rock has crystalline structure. The ash has no crystalline structure. It's glassy. <coughs> And it's very fine and porous. There's pukas. If you take a high power magnifying glass and look at a volcanic ash particle, it's got pukas in it, which means what can get in there? Yeah. Water. Water. And the more surface area, the more reactivity and chance for transformation. That's why these soils develop so quickly. Within 20,000, 30,000 years, you can have a deep soil. That doesn't happen on other landscapes, okay? So this is a dominant soil. We're gonna talk about it in some detail in a minute, but you can see, you can see where it is, right? Dominant soil, volcanic ash. And these are all poo-poo, poo-poo, poo-poo. You, you recall when the eruptions were occurring in Kilauea or Leilani Estates, there was lava flow, but there were explosions as well, right? And those explosions were blanketing the landscape with ash. So continuously, we're developing new parent on the Big Island. Continuous. All right. The other soil I'm going to speak to is these soils that we call histosol, the brown one. I already told you that histo means tissue in Greek, ancient Greek. Now we're learning another language. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And we call them histosol because it's rock and organic matter. Right? And these soils are quite dominant on our landscape, and they're younger landscapes. They're younger meaning these are a'a uh -uh or pahoehoe flows that you know range in age from probably two, 3,000 years old to maybe 12, 13, 14, 15,000 years old. Okay? So you have to have a little bit of age for these soils to form, right? Come back in 3,000 years, there won't be soil here. There won't be a lava flow. Okay? All right. And you can see they're quite common, quite common, right? These are these soils that you probably just call a uh -uh soils. Right? You know them. They're, they're, they're just rock, but there's organic matter. That what, that's why we call them a soil. That's why we call them a soil, okay? The other soils, this insectosol, is, used to be an endosol, and it's now moving towards maybe becoming a molar soil or another kind of soil. So that's the other cool thing about soils. They're dynamic on the landscape. 
They're not fixed. They can move and become something else. It's just they move and become something else at a very different time scale than you and I. This is the geologic time scale. They transform over thousands of years. Us, if we're lucky, we're here for 70, 80 years, right? Soils don't change naturally in 70 or 80 years, typically. There might be some exceptions. All right. So I'm not going to speak to those unless any of you are from Kohala and you want me to. But let's do that later, okay? All right. So not too much soil diversity on Big Island. Two main soil types. Do you agree? Why? You know, on, on Oahu, there are nine. On Kauai, there are 10. Why? They're older. Okay? More time for those five factors to interact. Okay? So this has just got numbers now. You see the very, very wettest parts of, of Hamakua, 280 yeah. inches of rainfall? That, that's really an extraordinary amount of water. It's an extraordinary amount of water. And, and you can think of this having occurred over thousands of years, right? Thousands of years of this kind of rainfall with probably some fluctuations, but that is a wet environment. And so weathering occurs. So we can already predict I would think that those Hamakua soils are inherently in the, the clay fraction where the clays are. There is clay. There's a lot of clay, actually. And that clay would be fertile or infertile? Yeah. Infertile. The fertility of those soils resides in the topsoil. Remember, for thousands of years prior to Hawaiians coming, remember the first Hawaiians populated these islands you know, the earliest dates, some people report 480, 450 AD, but they've, they've now revised those numbers and think it's probably the, the, the influx of Polynesians up here. Remember, Hawaii and Aotearoa were the last of the islands to be populated. They were the last. So probably 1100, 1000 AD. So humans have been on this landscape. What is that? Let's do some math. That's like a thousand years little less than a thousand years, that's not very long. You can imagine that for thousands of years, the Hamakua coast was forest, forest. Like, like an equatorial rainforest, it was forest. But humans do what? We clear forests. This is a given, don't shake your head. It's a given, accept it embrace it, and then say, how can we make it better? Yeah, cool. Okay. Now, remember these lines. I'm going to show not all andesols are equal. We have three kinds of andesols on the big island. The very wet andesols, Kohala Mountain, Amakua Coast, the moderately wet andesols, Waimea, and mid-elevation Kohala, and Pahala, and the dry andesols, Waikoloa, yeah? And they're all andesols, all form in the volcanic ash, all have non-crystalline clays, all have similar water holding capacity, it's just fertility and depth vary based upon rainfall. So let's examine it. I'm choosing two kinds. Okay, now these lines, you know, soil maps, we draw lines, right? But on, in nature, we know. It, it's not like, okay, you're on this side of the yeah, line. This is, no, nature is much more complex, but we have to do our best. We use fuzzy logic and other kinds of silly mathematics. And say, well, this is our best. Yes, aerial photographs, some distinct change, right? You see two different purple colors. I don't know. I see purple. You see purple too? Some people tell me, what? Well, purple? Okay, magenta. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Here and here. Okay? They're ash soils. They can be very deep or not so deep, but they're ash soils. Okay? And the soils. 
I separate the two, I didn't separate, mappers, soil scientists separate these into two classes of andosols. Wet, highly weathered andosols and moderately weathered, very fertile andosols. And you can see the separation. The magenta is the fertile cousin and the purple is the infertile cousin. Why? Rainfall. Okay, so these landscapes get anywhere from 80 to over 200 inches. We saw that on, on the previous map. Leaching environment, acid soils, low nutrient status, okay? When you get into this more moderate rainfall, the, these landscapes, now, climate is changing. We know that. It's getting progressively drier in Hawaii. That, that's, I think the, the trends are quite clear. But for thousands of years, these climatic um, differences helped. And that's what's forming those soils, right? They didn't form over 50 years. No, they formed over tens of thousands of years, right? Okay. And you have these moderate, okay? Now, the wet ones, nutrient depleted because of leaching, acid pH. Require high, high nutrient inputs if you're going to be farming them. The forest doesn't need nutrient input. Why? It has that organic matter and it has all manner of microbes that are interacting with the roots in favorable ways. And the organic matter is supplying nutrients. Forest trees, oh, if you give them nutrients, they'll take them, but they don't need them. They don't need them, right? They've evolved to be um, adapted to these types of conditions. Now, those were forests. If we were to have gone to Waimea, no, Waimea, 500,000, no, no, that's too long ago because it was still, let's see, I have to operate on a different time scale for the big island. Let's say um, 10,000 years ago, if I went to Waimea, there would be soil there because, you know, those, those landscapes, the parent, or something like 150,000 years old. That's the, the age of, of that volcanism. So 20,000 years ago, things would have happened, right? And it would have been a moderately wet seasonal rainfall pattern. In the winter months, rainfall. In the summer months, dry. What vegetation would have thrived? Grasses, savanna, open dryland forest, right? So those grasses do what? They build up a nice, rich organic matter layer. Okay? And so that goes on for thousands of years. Well, certain fact, you know, when the Hawaiians came, a yeah, thousand years ago, when they started organizing themselves and started doing large-scale agriculture, that didn't occur probably till the 1400s. It took 300 years or so for people, to, the population to grow. If you don't need to be organized, why be organized? <laughs> I love that. But you get to a certain population size, and you need organization, right? You need ali'i kolohiki, ali'i nui, mo'i, right? And then you got to organize. And what did the Hawaiians do? They needed to grow food. We all need to grow food. On this island, where did they go to grow sweet potato? Large-scale plantations of sweet potato. Hundreds of acres of sweet potato. They went right here. There's archaeological evidence of 32 square miles. 32 square miles. That's a lot of hectares, a lot of acres of rock walls, terraces, and no use of that land to grow sweet potato, Hawaiian sugar, uh, other dry land. But the sweet potato was a big one. Why did they go there? Soil. Best soil in the world. Best soil in the world. Okay. Now, uh, the Hawaiians got displaced, right? Large scale invasion. Poeaole. Hey, I want that land. Bro, what you doing? And what did the Haole do? They put sugar cane on those lands. Why? Good soil. Good soil. They're going to grow lots of sugar cane. 
Yeah, we can be a Marxist and look at it from a Marxist interpretation. <laughs> yeah, you can look at it from all kinds of interpretations. But history is important. Yeah? Then, in the 30s, certain families, mainly of Japanese ancestry, they recognized this is good land. They started getting parcels, 50 acres, 100 acres. And what did they grow? Cabbage, oh. romaine lettuce, broccoli, celery. Maybe you know some of these names. Jiraco, Kawano, Yamamoto. These were the big farmers of Guinea. They all retired. They were so successful. It's down. <laughs> Fertile soil. Lower fertility. Not bad soil. No, no, no. If you know how to manage it, you can grow just as much as on the other soil. The only difference being is when you have a lot of rainfall, there's a heavy pest pressure, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, rots, viruses. This is another whole level of complexity and challenge. It's how to manage pests. All right, getting better, huh? Getting better. Now let's let's go to let's go back one. Let's go back one. Okay. I keep I keep talking about pahala, right? I really love pahala. It's just, just something about pahala. I work with farmers there. In pahala, is there just one end of salt in pahala? Here's pahala, right? You know, this is all end of salt. Is there just one end of salt in pahala? It's all the same. No, no, good. All right, um, Mona. So, how many? I don't know. I'm sorry. Two. Yes, maybe three, because down at the coastline it's really dry. So remember, I said there are three anisols in the Big Island. Well, let's let's go with two. So here, mid elevation Pahala is the same soil at mid elevation Kohala, Waimea, Pukapu. You go up into the forest. Up into the forest, what kind of soil? The wet, acid, leached and the soil. Make sense? Okay. So now you're seeing some interactions of elevation, parent material, age, and you're going to be able to make some predictions about ash soils. Okay, good. Remember, there's a test at the end. I brought it. It's going to come up here and you're going to have to do it. Okay, here you go. So those fertile andesols, rainfall ranges from 25, maybe up to 60 inches per year, nutrient rich, near neutral pH, high productivity with, with less inputs. That's the key. High productivity with less input. So they were inputs. The Hawaiian certainly. You have to have inputs. That's not been well described because no records were kept of that field system. My guess, here's my guess. Hawaiians like pigs, right? What Hawaiian doesn't like a pig? You name one, my wife. <laughs> She's a city girl, that's why. Pigs, I guarantee you they ran pigs through after they harvested their, their sweet potato. The pigs would eat whatever they left behind. That's a good food. And they till it up, drop their thing, fertility. Again, manure, huh? That's my theory. Some Kanaka going to say, hey, holy, hamo. what do you know? <laughs> okay. I want to show this. Here's a farm in Waimea. Yeah, this guy could grow any kind of lettuce you want. He made a lot of money too. Guess where he sold the lettuce? Waikoloa Hilton. Oh. Yeah, all those, all those fancy hotels. They loved him. They loved him because he would bring this beautiful lettuce. How did he do it? He knew his soil. He knew his soil. Is that soil going to continue growing lettuce? He died, passed oh. away. Oh, it could continue. Was he using any inputs? Absolutely. He was using fertilizer. Did he know how to use it? Absolutely. He knew how to use it well. Just enough. And then, every now and again, get some compost and spread it over everything. 
that cost a lot of money. So the, it depended on the bank that year. Do I have enough money to buy that compost? Capitalism, isn't that something what they say, something like that? Okay. All right, ash soils. We now have introduced to you two kinds of volcanic ash soils, andesols. They differ based upon what? What makes them different? Rainfall. Rainfall makes them different, okay? However, on no matter where you are, the slopes of Mount Fuji, Hokkaido, Hokkaido, who's been to Hokkaido? Oh, do you see the vegetable farms in Hokkaido? Wow. Mm. I would go live in Hokkaido, except there's a little cold for me. <laughs> little cold. Volcanic ash soil. No matter where you are. Cameroon, Mount Cameroon, the third highest volcano in the African continent, has endosols around it. Why? Volcanic ash. Yeah. They're light. These are light soils. Why? Remember I began the lecture saying that the soils of Hamakua break the first rule of that soil pie? They're not 50% pore space. They're more like 80% pore space. If they're 80% air, it's going to make them light, right? Make sense? Okay. So they're generally light. Now, if you've compacted them, if they become compacted, they might seem a little bit like, wow, that Jonathan, he lying to me. <laughs> but if I were to put a core in there, I would show you that I would measure a bulk density less than 0.9. Doesn't mean anything to you folks, but that's light. Okay, they float in water, these soils. Other soils sink because they have a density more than one. What's the density of water? One. Okay, all right. Andesols, by definition, have high organic matter content, whether they formed in the drier environment or in the wet environment. The reason being the clay content, the clays of these soils have the highest surface area of any clay in the world. Surface area. Can you picture that? One gram of allophane, that's the clay, that is common to all andesols, whether you're in Hokkaido or Cameroon or Hamakua, one gram of allophane has 1,200 meters square of surface. One gram, like this much, has 100 meters by 10 meters, 12 meters of area. They do. What does that mean? Lots of place for reaction. Organic matter will react with those surfaces and get connected to those surfaces and stay there for thousands of years. We've measured the age of organic matter in the Hamakua forest, 12,000 year old organic matter. It's been there for 12,000 years. How come? It's protected by that surface. And the soils, by definition, have high organic matter. By definition, well, Let's not say by definition. These two types of andesols are either near neutral or acidic, depending upon rainfall. And both soil types tend to be low in phosphorus, both, whether they're in the high or wet area. Why? Allophane again. Allophane has a strong, or phosphate, the soluble form of phosphorus, has a strong affinity for allophane surface, and it makes a chemical bond, a covalent bond, that's very difficult to break. So if you add triple superphosphate fertilizer to the subsoil of either of these soils, the phosphate will dissolve, but very quickly it will get connected to the clay surface and then the plant can't get it. Ah, okay. Well, what did the Hawaiians do? They didn't have triple superphosphate fertilizer. They grew crops that didn't have a high phosphorus requirement. Sweet potato has a low phosphorus requirement. Taro has a low phosphorus requirement. Ulu has an even lower phosphorus requirement. Okay? But if they needed phosphorus, where'd they get it? Pigs. 
That's one of the best fertilizers you can ever imagine, pig manure. Never throw pig manure away. Please put on a mask and shovel it into your field. Okay, here's some data. This is measured. I'm not making it up. Waimea soil, about 30 inches of rain. We're, we're, we're near, we're in Parker Ranch land. You guys know Parker Ranch, grassland? We went and collected soils, lots of soils. Yeah, and here's the average. 13.1% organic carbon. That, that's 20% that's organic matter. 20%. What did that first graph tell us about soils around the world? 5%. Four times more organic matter than the typical soil. Okay. pH, near neutral. 6.4. Perfect for lettuce. Perfect. Perfect for Pakalolo, too, in fact. Calcium, 6,000 parts per million. Beautiful. Calcium rich soil, not from fertilizer, from the parent at the right weathering state. Magnesium, rich in magnesium, parent. Potassium, rich in potassium, parent. It's still there because it's not enough rainfall to leach it. Make you sense? Now you got numbers. They're not BSing. <laughs> Rainfall, Miley. Here's in um uh this is another ranch. Um, I work a lot with ranchers. I like ranchers, they're protecting lands. If they're good, they know how to protect our land and they're keeping it green. Say hello to any rancher you see. It's like mahalo yaoi. This is um Kukayao. Wet, 120 inches of rain, four times more rain than in Waimea. Organic carbon, even higher, approaching 30% organic matter. Wow. You go to the mainland, people will say, no, you're lying. You cannot have a mineral soil with 30% organic matter. Remember what Goro said? Find the exceptions, Jonathan. pH 5.5, not too bad, but that's acid. I wouldn't say that's bad, but you're getting low. Calcium, wow, oh, six times less calcium. This is a low number for many agronomic crops like cabbage or lettuce or tomato. You want at least 2,000 parts per million calcium. So we're well below the calcium requirement for many food crops. Okay, do something. Magnesium, 10 times less. Potassium, 10 times less. How come? Okay, I think I've repeated myself enough. What do you think? You're going to leave this room and some things are going to stick in your head. And then I can go home and my wife can say, Jonathan, hea kohana hikila. Oh, my, my guy, I with students. Did they learn anything? I don't know, Malia. That's up to them. And then you bring out a bowl of ava. <laughs> really, a little bit. Okay, now we're gonna look at two kinds of lava rock soils. Okay, very different, very different. Like on the opposite end of the spectrum, can't get as different, okay? And, and we put them into, um, again, climate is a key driver here. If you're in a, a more dry environment, the same rules apply. The pH will be a little higher the neutral status will be a little higher as opposed to if you're in a very wet environment. pH will be low, lower and nutrient status will be lower due to leaching. leaching. Okay, so we, we use the same um, approach, but they're so different. There's a lot of things. You, you, we have to be a little careful with these sauces because they're so different. So I'll try, you know, help us along. This is just the distribution. Dry types, wet type, I mean, dry pahoy hoy, wet pahoy hoy, and then dry uh -uh, pahoy hoy. Okay. This is dry because remember, you're going above the, uh, the inversion zone, right? You know, at a certain level. All of this is what? It's forested. These are forested areas. Okay. Here, what has happened in this area of corner? 
very interesting. That's why history is important. We need to think of Kona before the invasion in 1776. Think about Kona. This was breadbasket. This is even on these soil. They're rocky. What did our Hawaiian ancestors plant in these areas? Lots of, huh? Ulu. These were Ulu lands. Just enough rain. And Ulu doesn't need a lot of nutrients. I think I already said that. Get enough rainfall, and they are, they are abundant in their production. So these were Ulu lands. After, after that land use changed and the invasion occurred, those same places became what? Coffee. Right? <laughs> these are prime coffee lands. I didn't tell you, my first major when I was a 17, 18, 19 year old, I was a history and art history major. I didn't study science. I was looking at Marx's interpretation of art as a form of revolution. Yeah, we like that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you all these slides. You're gonna get them. Please don't put them on YouTube. <laughs> Let the YouTubers go do something else. Very different soil, so we have to have a different mindset. You know, you can't grow lettuce in these a'a uh -uh soils. You can't grow ulu, I mean, you can't grow uala, sweet potato, unless you do something, a pakukui, unless you excavate and fill with organic matter. That's what Hawaiians did. Excavate, fill, backfill with organic matter, okay? But here are some dominant properties. They're mostly rock, is mostly rock almost no clay. They don't hold a lot of water. Why? Because it's rock. The water just flows right through them. The, the only constituent of these soils that holds water is the small amount of organic matter because it has high surface area. Okay? They're excessively well-drained. They drain water too quickly. So if it's in a dry area, there's not much vegetation. It doesn't support a lush vegetation. But in wet areas, these are all those ohia forests with various other native trees because they can handle, they get rain all the time. They are building that soil. They are building that soil. In the high rainfall areas, Pahoa, uh, Ke'au, where there's high rainfall in these rocky soils, you can expect acid conditions. You can expect acid conditions. Think about macadamia. A good proportion of macadamia are grown on these soils. Why? Macadamia likes good drainage. And macadamia have a special kind of root, proteoid roots. These masses of roots that can take advantage of scarce nutrients. Yeah? I think you're, you're a macadamia guy, right? Yeah, correct. So if I say any nonsense, make sure you tell me. I have a question that was online. Oh, yeah. Um, can manures provide calcium and magnesium? Yes. If the animals were raised on soils that are poor in calcium and magnesium? Ah. Uh, <laughs> well, if you're collecting manure, you're generally feeding that animal. And so you're supplying them. Right. So if, you know... If, a grazing cattle can suffer from these magnesium deficiencies, maybe because the forage is weak, but you're not collecting that manure. The manure that we purchase or that is stockpiled is typically from fed animals, right? And we're feeding them all the nutrients that they need. Their manure is rich. It's a perfect fertilizer, but that's a good question. We don't go out and collect manure from grazing cattle. I hope that answers. Does that make sense? I was pig manure then, so pre when that we're not feeding the pigs. I mean, these are wild pigs. Oh. Well, the pigs are eating good stuff up in the forest, and there's nutrients in, in the, and we're not using that manure. Yeah. Oh, no. We're not using feral pig manure. We, we go to a pig farm oh. and say, hey, brother, give me your manure. It smells bad, but man, it's gold. So good question. We don't collect feral pig manure. 
as a parasite? No, are you, you can walk through the forest and pick <laughs> up pig manure. No. But isn't there a concern with that? When you... Oh, well, manures, you have to be careful because in its raw state, it's full of pathogens. So you have two approaches. You either compost it, a good composting prog program that raises the temperature in the compost pile and kills all of those pathogens, my guy. Or you add it to soil prior to planting and let it sit for a month. The microbes in the soil are going to compete and those pathogens go away. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay, so can I, I'm going to go on. How are we doing on time? We're good for 11. Ooh, I haven't even gotten a third of the way through. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Don't worry about this. Okay, very quickly. So, all right, before I move on, we've got an hour left. So, do we have a, a feeling for soils on the big island now? Yeah. Um, if I if if um if if I say we're at um Pa'awilo. Pa'awilo. You guys know Pa'awilo? Okay, Pa'awilo is up the Hamakua coast right before Honoka. Okay, right before Honoka. Okay, um, tell me something. What kind of soil would you expect first in the big? Is it is it a rocky soil, a lava soil? Yeah. No. Why? It's old, comparatively. It's still very young. But it's maybe 100,000 100, years old, 150,000 years old, right? Okay, all right. What kind of soil is that? Forms from? Ash. Okay, it's an andesol, and it formed from? Volcanic ash. Okay, tell me something about that soil. <laughs> okay, in the old days, prior to human interaction, the nutrients were in the topsoil, in the A horizon, because it was all forest. We know all of that land was transformed into sugarcane and was in sugarcane for a long time, 50 years, maybe more. Uh, about 50 years. Okay, that we lost that surface layer of organic matter. They could continue to grow sugarcane there because they were doing what? They were fertilizing, mainly with nitrogen, mainly, and some potassium. Okay, let's. What about the pH of that soil? Acid. Slightly acid, five, five and a half. Okay, some of them can be lower, but we're on the acid. Okay, good. Uh, what about organic matter? Even though you lost that rich A horizon, what about organic matter? It's still high because that soil conserves organic matter. Even against us who are telling you, I'm gonna beat you up. You say, hey, no, no, you can't beat me. I'm the Muhammad Ali <laughs> of soil organic matter. Okay, good. All right, now we say, I'm gonna go to Lala Milo. Alex, you know where Lala Milo is? Okay. Okay. Quiz next week. <laughs> Learn the geography of the Big Island. You are master gardeners. You're going to be on a phone. They're going to tell you're going to first question. You're going to ask, where are you? And if they say Lala Milo, you know, okay. I'm not. I'm not. Got to know your place. Got to know your place. That's what Uncle Eddie taught me. Number one, know your place. Know the history of that place. Know the people of that place. Okay, Lala Milo is the dry side of Waimea. Okay, you know where Parker Ranch uh, headquarters is? That's that's Lala Milo. Okay, all right, we're in Lala Milo. Ah, what's your name? Tyler. Okay, what do you think? What kind of soil are you gonna find in Lala Milo? Okay, it's, it's not so dry, it's moderately dry. Okay, but what kind of soil? And it's soil. And it's soil. It's an ash soil, because it has an older landscape, yeah? And the soil. And, and you say it's, 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 it's got a wet season. But I would say you're right. Dry, but enough water over tens of thousands of years to have weathered into soil. Yeah? And tell me something about that soil, uh, Nahele. Uh, Neutral pH, yes. Uh, what's nutrients also? Right? Lots of nutrients. Good. What about organic matter? 
High organic matter, all endosomes are high in organic matter. Okay, good. All right, we're doing well. Yeah. Then we have the rock soils, the lava rock soils. Mostly rock, low nutrient retention, low water holding capacity. You got to intentionally do serious something if you want to grow food crops there. It's good, good land for papaya. Really good land for papaya. Why? Papaya don't like wet feet. And those soils drain really well. But if you want to do a commercial papaya operation on those soils, you've got to prepare the land. Dig a puka, backfill with ash soil, plant your papaya. That's a lot of work, right? Did Hawaiians use those lands for food? Yeah. What, what would grow really well on those? Ulu. Pakukui. Taro. All right. You guys are doing great. That's the main thing. You will now leave this room and you have a much better idea. Now all you need to do, Alex, is study the, the map of the different moku, the different places, Pahala, Kiala Kikua, South Kona. All right, now nutrients. Let's talk a little bit about nutrients. All right, we're not going to go really down into the, into the molecular Hardcore chemistry, it's all chemistry, actually, and a little bit of biology, because mi microorganisms interact here. But the key point is for a plant, a plant needs nutrients. Every plant needs nutrients. And they get most of their nutrients from the soil solution. Okay? The water in the soil. A dry soil cannot supply nutrients to a plant because those nutrients need to be dissolved, right? Dissolved. Do we, do we have a, a concept of cation and anion? Okay, a cation is a positively charged element that's dissolved in water. Example, calcium, Ca2+, it has a charge. Yeah, potassium is a cation, A+. Plus dissolved in the water. Phosphate, H2PO4 minus anion, negative charge. Okay, we won't get too into the, into the chemistry here, but it's good to have that concept. These plants need dissolved elements, okay? First, that's what this represents here. Dissolved elements in the water, the soil water. Here's plant roots, right? The plant roots, let's imagine this is a potassium ion. The plant roots like, hey, I want some potassium. It absorbs it, right? Make sense? So dissolved state is the key state. Now, if you remember some of your chemistry, you remember that pH has a role in whether something is dissolved or precipitated. Remember that word, precipitated? meaning it goes out of solution and forms salt or it becomes solid. A lot of that is pH driven. It's more complicated than that, but we'll keep it simple, right? All right, so we need to know something about the pH. We've already learned something about pH though. Wow, I can predict the pH in the soils of Hamakua and I can predict the pH in the soils in Waimea if they haven't been managed. Right? Just did that. All right. Now, most of the nutrients in the soil are not in soil solution. No, they're not in soil solution. Most of the nutrients are connected to clay surfaces within clay crystal matrix or connected to organic matter. Organic. And the key process is charge. Clay surfaces, the general rule, but remember I said Hamakua soils or Hawaii soil, Big Island soils break the general rule. We're gonna break it again. Ooh, good fun, good fun. The general rule, clay surface has a negative charge. What does that mean in terms of elements, cations? It, traps it doesn't trap them. Trap 
attract good acts. See, my hearing is not so good. Thank you, Sarah. Attraction. So those positive, here's a calcium. Ooh, there's a negative charge on, on, on the clay surface. It's held there. Permanent? No, not permanent. It can be exchanged to the root or to the soil solution. Okay? That's really important. That's one of the foundations of soil fertility is the ability of the clays to attract those plant nutrients. Most clays are negative charge. <clears throat> it turns out that the Hamakua clay, I'm going to say a name, no one needs to remember, fairy hydrate. It's an iron oxide, poorly crystalline iron oxide. It has positive charge. Mm. Well, what happens when calcium comes near that clay surface? Repulsion. When it's being repulsed, if it's raining, where does it go? Bleached. Another reason for low fertility in the subsoil. It's related to the clay type and the surface charge. Won't be on the test. That's for my class. If you come with me, oh, Akahele. Hmm. Organic matter. Always high negative charge. Always. Ooh. No wonder when that A horizon is rich in organic matter, there were lots of nutrients for the forest. The organic matter is holding the nutrients because the clay can't. Nature has taken care of that. When we plow away the A horizon, we remove fertility. Okay? Making sense? All right. So let's move along. Move along, move along. Okay. Cation exchange capacity. Well, that's that negative surface charge. Negative surface charge on either organic surfaces, organic matter surfaces, or clay surfaces. In your California book, they'll talk about cation exchange capacity. And some of the soils, many of the soils in California have some of the highest cation exchange capacities of all soils. It kind of makes sense, huh? California is loaded with really fertile soil. It's like one of the most amazing agricultural food growing places in the world. Up until a few years ago, the agricultural output of one state was more than many countries all put together. Why? Because they were blessed with super good soils. The San Joaquin Valley, Central Valley, the Central Coast, Monterey, and inland Salinas. Who's been to Salinas? It's all lettuce and spinach. Why? Perfect. Low rainfall. So far, get irrigation water and perfect soil. 95% of the cut lettuces in the United States come from Salinas Valley. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Cation exchange capacity. Those soils have very high cation exchange capacity. They're low in organic matter. So what? The clay is loaded with this negative charge. It can hold all of these nutrients and lots of them. High fertility, okay? Fairy hydrate, the subsoil of our Hamakua soil, positive charge. So that means it doesn't have cation exchange capacity, or it's low. Uh, 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 a Salinas soil in, at, at, say, 50 centimeters down, half a meter down into that soil, got clays there, it might have cation exchange capacity of 40. Don't, don't worry about the unit. It's a weird sounding name. Centimoles of charge per kilogram. Don't worry about that. You go to very hydritic soil in Hamakua, Pa'awilo, Honoka'a, Hilo. I, I don't care where you go. And you go down 50 centimeters or 60 centimeters and you measure cation exchange capacity, it's two. Sometimes it's zero. It's all anion exchange. Ooh, wow. Weathering, weathering, oxides. Same thing in, in, in the Amazon forest of Colombia. Go down 60 centimeters, red soil, no cation exchange capacity. Why is the forest growing? 
organic matter in the surface. What happens when they clear the forest to grow soybean in Brazil? Same soil. They got to put fertilizer. Now, we're shaking our heads, but you know how many people's lives in Brazil depend upon that farming? I go to Brazil a lot. It's a complicated society, very complicated. They're industrious, hardworking people. Got to eat. Got to eat. Ah, okay. Negative charge, clay. Negative charge, organic matter. Cation exchange. Going from solution to clay surface, solution to clay surface, solution to clay surface. Okay, plant root comes along. Ooh, I want potassium. Ooh, into the plant. Okay, fundamental. If your soil, you know that your soil is low cation exchange capacity soil, like that Hamakua soil, what do you do? Add manure. That's the best because the fertilizer comes from far away. It's not cheap and it gets tied up in these clays. The chemistry is a little bit more complicated than I'm presenting, but it's only a master gardener class. Okay, manure. I used to work with pig, pig farmers, right? They're going out of here too, huh? You know, why and I, where I live, Makaha, why and I, we had choke pig farmers 20 years ago. Not, not, not too many anymore. How come? First of all, the kids, they were so successful. The kids, not on the farm anymore. They went to college, Duke, Rice University, engineers, software. One, one good friend of mine's son is now brewing beer, making good money. He's like, Jonathan, uncle, he goes, I don't want to go to work on my dad's farm. Steak over there. Right? Pig manure. Mm. Any pig farmers in Hamakua? Find them. <laughs> and if you were my huh? straight habitat a couple. Pigs are really good manure. Really, really. I tell you, if you eat pork, raise your own pigs and get their manure. What would my mom have been doing? Jonathan, Jonathan, if you want to see the finish of the song, okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Now, you see, we can say cation exchange capacity is fertility. High cation exchange capacity means a naturally fertile soil. That's not rocket science. You can now see that, right? Here's how we classify soil fertility on the big island based upon cation exchange capacity. And you can see the interaction with time. If it's a young landscape, it's all rock and rainfall. High rainfall. Lower cation exchange capacity. Intermediate rainfall, high cation. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Don't worry about it. that. Won't be on the test either, unless you come take class with me. pH. Let's do a quick one on pH. We're going to go quickly through these things. We've already talked about pH. I think everybody has a sense pH scale goes from zero to fourteen. There's a reason for that. It's based upon the dissociation of the water molecule, OH and H plus. Don't worry about that. For us, we want to know well for plant growth. There's a pretty wide range for plants. Okay? Some plants do very well in very acid soils. Some plants can grow in a soil with a pH of 3.84. Can you name any? Food crops, oranges, blueberries. <laughs> blueberries, exactly, Sarah. Blueberries love low pH. In fact, it's preferred. Plant your blueberries in soils with pH below five. Perfect. Okay. Pineapple. Pineapple is pretty. It can go. The pineapple do no problem. pH four point five, not a problem. Okay, but other crops, lettuce citrus, they cannot handle low pH. If it's below 5, 5.5, they don't grow well. They have a high calcium requirement. So if you measure the pH and it's below 5.5 and you want to grow citrus, have a program. What would my mom say? Add manure. Add manure. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay. TH, again, it depends crop type. If you're growing ulu, don't worry about pH. That's not the problem. Something else is the problem if it's not growing well. It's not pH. I've been, you know, ulu is across the whole Pacific. I do a lot of work in Chuk, Ponpe, Marshall Islands, Yap. Beautiful ulu tree that produced thousands of pounds of ulu with no inputs, zero inputs. The pH might be 4.8 in the soil. What does that tell you? Adaptive. Okay. Many of our food crops are a little bit more sensitive to soil pH. Lettuces, cabbages, carrots, uh, onions. Many of these, the Asian or European vegetable crops, you got to pay attention to pH. Fruit trees, a little bit more tolerant, but citrus does not like very acid soil. No, it, it wants it near neutral. Coffee, in fact, grows best when it's between six and seven. They'll still grow in acid soils, but oftentimes that middle is, is the best, okay? So that's why I have the green box here. Why is it an optimum area? Because most of the essential plant nutrients are optimal availability in that range. Most of them, okay? A lot of people like to call pH the master variable. It's probably the first measurement to take. It's one of the easiest to take. It doesn't require a lot of technology. In fact, I think Russell brought a couple of pH meters today and we'll do some measurements and you see how easy it is. It's just interpreting the number. You need to know the crop. Oh, I'm, I'm growing guinea grass. Does it matter? Yeah, does. I'm growing um, Huckleberry. Does it matter? Yeah, pH matters. You gotta manage pH. Okay, know your crop. So this is just a general idea. It's not the gospel. No, no. Just it just gives you a a, a reference point. Yeah, it's a reference point. Sugar cane, quite quite adaptable. It can grow in, in, in a quite wide range of, of pHs. I think I'm going to skip this because it's, 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 it's quite rare on this island to come across um, toxicities. It's quite rare, meaning a pedogenic toxicity. What does that mean, pedogenic? Toxicities that can occur in the soil naturally. It's quite rare. There are some things to pay attention to. Some of our hamakua soils, some of them, depending on their length of time, sugar cane, and the amount of nitrogen fertilizer that was applied into those soils can have quite low pH, 4, 4.2, 4.5. That is a problem because at that low pH, one of the most serious problems is high soil aluminum. It's not coming from fertilizer. It's not coming from the atmosphere or the contrails or, or some alien or, or a liberal or you know, some No, it's coming from the dissolution of the clay. The original. The Earth's crust. You guys have a sense of the elements that make up the Earth's crust? The two dominant are oxygen and hydrogen followed by silica, then aluminum. That's what our crust, those are the dominant. Everything else is very minute. Calcium is minute amounts. There's a lot of aluminum in soil. Fortunately, it's bound up in crystals. So it's, it's not affecting light. Aluminum in solution is toxic in this way. Microbes, humans. But there are mechanisms in nature to protect life from aluminum. The most important being crystalline structure. The second most important being organic matter. Because organic, dissolved organic molecules can entrap or surround an aluminum ion detox. So when you asked, what do you do when you have an acid soil? What was my, my mom's response? Add manure. Add manure. Lots of organic 
compounds that will detoxify those things. Now, if we have an aluminum salt, I think we do need to try with sugar cane. Now, when we grow fruit crops, does that come back in the It's crop? only if the pH is below 5.2. If the pH is above 5.2, the aluminum is it's just, tied up. It's tied up in the crystal. It's, oh, remember, I said there are some pockets as we go north of Hilo that might have pHs in the, in the low fives and, and high fours. Just make a measurement. If the pH is 5.5, you won't have an aluminum so you grow any animal crops the next one. Why not? You put up oh, well, you, you, they won't grow. <laughs> you could put them in. Right. If you have a soil that's 4.2, okay, I want to grow lettuce. What did I say? You got to do something, right, Tyler? Got to do something. What was my first choice? Manure. Add manure. It will, it, will, it will take care of that problem. If you don't have access to uh, manure, Compost. Compost will detoxify. If you don't have access to compost, lime. That's the last resort. <laughs> lime comes from far away. China, Morocco, Canada, Florida. We have some local lime quite high, but it's not good quality. I wouldn't recommend it. It's pretty impure. It's not bad, but you have to add a lot of it. So your pH is 4.5. On your on your land that was in former sugar cane and got acidified because of lots of nitrogen, get some manure. Can you test for it? Test I for mean, it. Oh sure, but we we don't need to test for it. If I if you show me a soil with pH four point two, I will tell you there's a lot of aluminum in there. Do something. We don't need to test for it, but we can. Question: If you if you get the if the pH is low now and you get a lot of rainfall and what. Does that aluminium do for the local environment? Because obviously, bleach or oh, it's it stays soluble. It's always there. It doesn't. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't hurt the water. It's, it hurts plant roots. Yeah, keep going. Um, here are the. Here's why we want to raise pH. Reduce toxicity, mostly aluminum, increase phosphorus availability, supply calcium and magnesium. If you're growing, you know, typical food crops, beans, peanuts, you know, bananas, quite an interesting crop. It can handle very acid soil. No problem. No problem. My recommendation to everybody is to correct. An acid soil, the first thing you should explore is what? Manure. Find some manure. There used to be botello, dairy manure. You know the dairy farm in, in um, Lower Kohala? Is he still in business? See, these are my old friends. I used to go with pickup trucks and truck manure to farms so that they could see. I don't need to import lime from Canada. I can use Uncle Botello's dairy manure and get the same effect. The only problem with uncle's dairy manure is guess what was in there? Uh, Weed seeds. Oh, that was one of my early mistakes as a young researcher. Oh boy, some of the farmers like, hey, bro, lucky you're helping me with other things because if not, you wouldn't be allowed on my farm ever again. So weeds are an important thing to think about when you're putting organic compost amendments. Be careful. Think about it. How do you kill weed seeds? Heat. Make a big compost pile. It'll kill the weeds and it'll kill the pathogens. All right. How are we doing? Woo, it's, it's like an 800. You guys run track? 800. I'm, I'm like the last 200 meters. Can I make it? Don't worry about this. Are you guys really in the line? I wouldn't be too. You can buy it. It works. It does good things, but it costs money. And look at what happens. Soils are like me. They don't like change. Baki key. You got to add a lot of lime to raise the pH. Here's an example. This is a generalized curve for all soils of Hawaii. All soils of Hawaii. Let's say. My friend Jacqueline, she goes into her, her, her or whatever, her land, and she takes a soil sample and she measures the pH. 
And this is the value she gets, 4.6. See that? 4.6, right? Oh, oh, man, that holy guy said I got to do something. <laughs> okay, I got to find female. Okay, chicken. No, no chicken. Dairyman. Oh, no dairyman. Oh, what do you do? Get some wine. You can buy line. They come in 50 pound bags. It was, used to be $11 for a 50 pound bag. I think it's more now. I don't know. Anybody know the price of line? Check them out. All right. That holy guy said I should have my pH at least at six, right? Remember six to seven? It should be at least six. Okay. I'm starting at 4.6. Here is six, right? Right? You see that? Okay. Ooh, I need two and a half tons of lime per acre. Two and a half tons. That's 5,000 pounds of lime. That's 100 bags, 150 pound bags. Now, a farmer can do that because they're, they're doing a balance, right? Input, output. And generally, the cost of the lime is going to increase production to be profitable. Because if they don't add the lime, they don't grow anything. So you see there, there's economics. A farmer has to do the economics. Is it in my interest to invest in lime? There's a lot of research. We've done all of this. We can sit down and, we, and they know. Okay, or we can help them. Ah, you know, Jonathan, <laughs> I don't have enough money for two and a half tons. Okay, well, let's do some math. What can you afford? Well, as long as we get the pH above 5.5, that's me, the soil scientist, say. Just get it above 5.5. Okay, 5.5. Ooh, now we're down at uh, one ton, uh, one and a quarter ton. Ah, okay, but we're going to do the calculation. Yeah, I can afford that. Boom, go do it. Homeowners, do they have to worry about this? No. Did my mom ever worry about this? Never, not once. Why? Because yeah. she's telling me, hey, you don't have time. Il faut aller chercher le fumier. You speak French? Oh, my brain's all mixed up. Even now I call my mom. I got to speak French with her. I love it, though. That's impressive, though. You know, so when my grandma was alive, at our dinner table was Italian, French, Spanish, English, Arabic. Mm -hmm. All mixed up. When the wine got flowing, Oh, you never knew what was going to happen. <laughs> okay. Last topic. How are we doing? How's the time? Doing okay. Uh, we're at 11.30, so... Perfect. Yeah. We can go get a bowl of ava before we measure pH. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to talk about soil organic matter. Okay, we've already... You've heard me repeat many times... Soils in the tropics, their function in the wet tropics is based upon organic matter. The organic matter came from the vegetation. Okay? So, Aina took care of itself before we showed up. Took care of itself. We've changed things. There's no choice. It's, it's, there's no other way. All humans have changed even going earlier, maybe hunter-gatherers had the least footprint. But any agrarian society changed their environment, whether you're Papua New Guinean, Cameroonian, Guinean, Hawaiian. My wife said, nah, John, the Hawaiians were perfect. We did everything perfect. Organic matter. Organic matter is queen. It's the number one thing to think about. Number one thing for soil. My mom was always right. Always. We argue about a lot of things, but we never argued about manure. <laughs> Not once. Here's the soil from southern Guam. Okay? Who's been to Guam? So, you know, southern Guam is the volcanic remnants. Northern Guam is the coral. It's been a long time, but yeah. Yeah, so Southern Guam is 40 million years old, Guam. How old is Big Island? Yeah, 
yeah, goes maybe that's that's a, a stretch from three hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand. Guam is forty million years old. Southern Guam is wet, and it's got elevation. And it used to be all forests, all forests. And then you know things change, right? What do humans do? Hey, we cut the forest, right? Now, here's a forest soil from Guam. See the red? It's an oxisol. Remember that soil that I pointed out early on of the equatorial rainforest? Africa, Amazonia. Okay. Guam has a lot of those equatorial oxide rich, highly weathered soils where the forest is. Look at the surface layer. I mean, this is just very distinct boundary. It almost looks like it's made up. <laughs> Look like it. No, come on. So much made this soil. No, if you go to the forests of Cameroon, or Gabon, or Congo, and dig down, you'll have a rich, dark surface layer, and then right below it, red. What's the red? Iron, Iron oxide. Why? High weathering. Loss of energy. Okay, here's a test question. Hey, Mr. Galanti, put them on your test, huh? Um, we actually don't put soils on our test. <laughs> I don't, I don't pop quiz, how about that? Okay. You and I work on a pop quiz and we'll give it to them. I think this requires a rethink. <laughs> don't put it on. But I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Right. Okay. In that oxide rich subsoil, what is the CEC? What is the cation exchange? No, no, very, no. very low. Where's the nutrients in this soil? No, in the surface, sorry. Organic matter, organic matter, organic matter. Goro is up, up there looking down on me, wondering if I'm still doing it right. Here are just a few, a selected few of the key roles that organic matter plays in a soil, no matter where you are. This is just a few of them. The list at each of the three levels there could go on. Yeah. But I'm going to reiterate that. We have physical behavior, the physical properties of soil. So things like water retention, water movement, pore size, amount of pore space, aeration. Okay. We have biological properties, the life of the soil, biological reactions, and we have the chemistry of the soils, right? Organic matter touches all of them, influences all of them. Even small amounts of organic matter have disproportionate effect on behavior. Let's start with something that we can relate to right away. Organic matter has high surface area. De you know, decomposed or get compost has high surface area. If I take a good quality compost and I wet it and then let it drain, and now it's moist but not saturated, I've let the water drain, and then I make a water measurement on that. How do I do that? Well, I weigh it in its moist state, I get a number. I put it in the oven and I heat it up at least to um, maybe 100 degrees C. I can't go too high because it'll burn, right? And then I reweigh it. And then I go, I want to know the water content. So I take the wet weight and I divide it by the dry weight and I'll get the water content. And guess what? The, and it's a, it's a percent, right? It's a percent. Guess what the number is going to be? 25. 25. Okay, it's a good story. One of my students, I asked him to do this. You know, you, hey, James, go measure the water content. It's not like this. Okay. Two weeks later, I don't have any results. He was from Mali, so we didn't speak English. We spoke French. So the students said, say, Mule, Chief, where's the numbers? Oh, my professor, my dear professor. Got a problem. What's that? I'm getting really weird numbers. What do you mean they're getting weird numbers? They don't make sense. I keep doing it and I keep getting the same weird number. 
What was the number? It's like 175 <laughs> percent, professor. Yeah. Uh, it's your first lesson. No, first lesson in surface area and water retention. By mass, you can hold much more water than you do actually weigh. So what does that translate to in the real world? You add organic matter, well composted organic matter to your soil, you can reduce irrigation because that soil is going to hold water, more water for longer. There's always a practice. Manure will do the same thing. My mom is always right. <laughs> Structure. Soils have structure. There's an architecture to soils. You've seen it. What, what, what words do you, if you look at a nice soil and, and you know, it's a good soil, what kind of structure will it have? Granular. You know, you look at a grassland or the surface there, it's got nice granules of roots all around it. And that means that water can pass in between, right? But, but that granule of soil there can hold water. Ooh. So it's not only letting water drain. Papaya doesn't like wet feet. I can name a lot of crops that don't like the soil to be saturated. They want the soil to drain, but they need water. Apples, right? You told me. Apples, if it's wet all the time, they don't grow well. So that structure allows the, the ped, the granule, to hold water. The roots can get in there, but it also allows water to drain. What is a key driver in making sure soils have a granular structure in the surface? It's like a glue. It's like a glue. Ah, I get excited about these things. Organic matter is light. So if you add compost to your soil, you can expect its mass over volume to go down. It less dense. Here's another story. I told you compost is expensive, right? Farmers in Hawaii don't have access to compost. Not like California. California have industrial compost operations. You can go buy a hundred yards of high quality compost and get it delivered to your farm, and the cost is not exorbitant. Here in Hawaii, we don't have that luxury because we don't have large scale compost production. Good quality. Maui has a quite interesting, who, who's been to uh, the dump just outside Kahului? You guys don't go to the dumps, you're not like we <laughs> Yeah, I go to those places. At the dump there, they're taking all the, the, the coconut frond waste from the, the, the resorts, and they pile, they, malt, they, what do they call that, shred it all up, and they make big windrows, and they put sewage sludge on top. Ooh. People don't yeah, but they don't put sewage sludge on it. Absolutely. Why is that sewage sludge good? Yeah. It's manure. Yeah. Now you see humans are like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, we got to change our mindset. Why throw that in a landfill, which produces methane gas, increases greenhouse gas emissions, or worse than that, dump it in the ocean? No, no, use it. So anyway, CITAR gives us researchers money every now and again. Hey, Jonathan, here's for your research program. Looks like you're doing good work this year. Okay, guess what I did with that money? I go buy compost for farmers. Hey, Mr. Yamamoto, I have 60 yards of compost. You know what 60, how much 60 yards is? It's like a big, huge dump truck. Oh, Jonathan, compost. No, I pay for it. Okay, put him in his field. 60 yards per acre. That's a good amount. The next year, he calls me up, Jonathan, you know, you know what I noticed after your compost put in my field? I used a third of the gasoline or the diesel fuel that I normally use when I till. How come? Well, Lightened up the soil. You know, other things, too. So then he says, hey, when are you getting your next uh, uh, <laughs> allocation from CTAR? I said, well, they're dry this year. So I write grants now. Those grants, I always make sure there's a nice allotment to buy compost for the farmers because they can't afford it. 
Thank you. You guys pay taxes, right? Mahalo nui. Those are USDA funds that we use now to directly help the farmer. Okay, you see, I could go through all of these and tell a story, 10 stories for each one, and we'd never get out of here. <laughs> What's the point? That's, that's one point. We began the lecture with that, but the point here is add organic matter. Homeowners, their first alternative should be organic matter because they can afford it. They can afford it. And they're usually on small acreage. If you're a 15 acre farm, things get a little bit more complicated from an economic perspective. Master gardeners won't be dealing with 15 acre farmers. No, right? I doubt it. If that farmer is calling master gardeners, <laughs> good luck to your operation. Hey, uh, right? a if, if a commercial grower calls the master gardener helpline, or somebody calls and you don't know if they're a commercial grower, the first thing to ask is, are you a commercial grower or are you a homeowner? But they're having a hard time figuring that out. Ask them if they make like $10,000 or more uh, and they have a commercial business or actually selling their product. If you're unsure, just send them on to me and I can forward them. Yeah, so that should go to a cooperative extent, right? Because there's expertise there, right? Okay, all right. So I began soil organic matter by telling, saying that organic matter is queen. Okay, it is. It says, should I say okay? Adobe Acrobat will damage your computer. Oh my God. <laughs> Do I say okay? Yeah. <laughs> it's all past me. I'm, I'm still in 1974, I, I think. Okay. Again, when you think about the health of your soil, that's a big topic now. It's overblown. You're like anything, it's a fad, but it's still important. Organic matter is fundamental to a healthy soil. Why? Because organic matter is feeding the life of that soil. Okay, so you can see in the same way, soil health benefits from applying manure and compost. Okay, here, here are just some things when we talk about what is a good soil. Here are some things we talk about. Look, is it light? Is it well aerated? Does it have good structure? A soil that doesn't have good structure, you won't see individual pads. You know, it'll just be massive, right? Does it have distinct architecture? These are questions you can ask to your clients. Does the water drain? Oh no, you know, it's always ponding. Well, is it compacted? Yes, till it up a bit. If you want to make sure that those peds stay glued together, what do you do? Add organic matter. A soil, a good soil retains water. Can we improve water retention? How? Add organic matter. A good soil supplies and retains nutrients. Even these Andesols and hamakua, nobody would ever say they're bad soils. They just have a low fertility. How do you manage that? Organic matter. <laughs> and if you're growing these kinds of vegetable crops, tomatoes, cucumbers, zucchini, we like to eat those things, right? If you're growing those kinds of crops, you, you need pHs near six, okay? If you're, if you're, growing canoe plants, the plants our ancestors grew. pH is not that important. Even kalo can grow in a soil with a pH of 5.5, no problem. Make sure it has the other nutrients. And your soil should be biologically diverse. Do you have to measure the biological diversity? No. How do you maintain biological diversity in a soil? I'm going to give you my mom's phone number. <laughs> Call her. But you got to speak French. 
or Italian or Spanish. Okay. What do you think? Oh, uh, well, let's ask the class. Yeah. So we're, we're hitting about 11.51, folks. Do you want to make the lab shorter? Do you want to extend the lab towards closer to 1 to 2 p.m.? Or should we cut it off? Preference? I warned everybody the classes are not exactly on time. I'll go quickly. There are a couple of key concepts. We won't dwell on them. But, and then when we're measuring pH, we're going to have ample time to hear more stories. Maybe let's do 30 minutes and we'll do a shorter pH. Okay. You guys are the boss. Yeah, okay. You tell and me. Go longer in lecture. You tell me. Raise your hands. Yeah. Okay. okay that's I'm on the 100 meter mark on the 800. <laughs> well, people can see. It's good. It's interesting. Here's my friend up in Waimea. He's, he's oh, hello, yeah. but he's up there. He used to give me hard times. He researchers. Yeah, there. You don't know Nati. <laughs> then he started listening because I saved him money. <laughs> Lots of money. Okay, soil testing. I'm not going to go in. It's a whole well developed science. Well developed. Almost 100 years of careful research. Homeowners don't necessarily need a soil test. If you're gonna recommend anything, pH, okay? Soil tests cost money. A good soil test needs to be sent to an agronomic lab. You gotta send it out. Here in Hawaii, we, do, we don't have that. I'm working with a couple of former students who are trying to develop a commercial lab. They are gonna do it. That would help us. We have one guy who is very reliable. His name is Peter Bunn. You can look him up, Crop Nutrient Solutions. He, he's a crop consultant. He can take a soil test, send it to a lab, get the results back, interpret it for you, and give you the results with an interpretation. Crop Nutrient Solutions. Here I'm working with some Pompeian farmers. We're doing simple Soil test kit. You know, I don't recommend that for master gardeners because you got to do the test. It takes time. You, you, know, you know, I'm going to get dirty, John. I don't want to get dirty. But <laughs> we love getting dirty in this case. There are good, there are good quality portable soil testing kits that work. But it takes an investment on your part to learn it and then know how to do it correctly. All plants need these essential nutrients. You can look it up. If you don't have enough in the soil for that crop to reach its potential, its biological potential, it must have adequate amounts of soluble or plant available nutrients. The plant itself is a very good What's the word? Yes. You can do a plant nutrient diagnosis by looking at the plant. If you look at that plant. This is a picture of corn. Don't worry. Huge amounts of research has been done on corn. Why? Money. Money. The corn lobby is huge, right? Unfortunately, Corn is used for all the wrong reasons. We're making corn starch, sugar, whatever. So we're not, but it's, it's really, when you think of it at a global scale, it's one of the most important things. Go and that, right? You think of our Navajo ancestors, or our my ancestors, the three sisters, right? Corn, squash, bean. The leaf will tell you if it's missing. You look all of this up and to Google. Magnesium deficiency in tomato. Oh, there it is. Uh, potassium deficiency in plum. <laughs> uh, zinc deficiency in pacololo. And you get the most picture. <laughs> 
the plant can tell you a lot. So as master gardeners, learning some of these deficiency symptoms will go a long way for you to help somebody because they can go, oh, you know, I'm having a hard time growing my citrus, really having a struggling and that it's not looking good. You can start at, well, tell me something about the leaves. What color are they? Where is it? The young leaf, the new leaf? Tell me, send me a picture. And then you can go to this rich database of imagery and you can make an initial diagnosis. Do you agree, Russell? Yeah, for most, for most major plants. You know, some of our crops, we're not going to have this. But I can tell you right now, I don't care what crop you're growing. Mamake. Um, name some others. Uh, uh, what's the one we, we make the tea out of? Cacao. There's a lot of pictures on cacao. But mamake, you will find no pictures on anti-Google of nitrogen deficiency in mamake. How do you know you have nitrogen deficiency in a mamake bush? Well, it's not growing too well, but it'll show you distinctly yellowing of the old leaves. Clear yellowing. The green, the new leaves are nice and green. The old leaves are all yellow. First diagnosis, nitrogen deficiency. Um, solution, manure. Manure has got nitrogen. Rich. This is just an example from Montana State University. It's a rich database of pictures to help you get an idea. Okay. Soil tests tell you what's in the soil. If something is missing, it will tell you what is missing, and then it'll give you a, an idea of what how much you need to add to correct it. You can't do that. My mom can't do that. A soil fertility lab does that. For a homeowner, do we need a soil fertility lab? No. Add manure. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to go through the science behind soil testing. Sometimes I go into this detail. But you know what? I'm not too interested in it today. This is key, though. There's a reason my mom always said manure. Manure, especially pig manure, especially pig manure, is rich in nitrogen, rich in phosphorus, and then has all of the remaining nutrients. The most limiting nutrient, typically, in an agricultural setting is nitrogen. That's very often the one that shows the first sign of you don't have enough. Why is that? Plants require a, quite a bit of nitrogen. Do you know why? Nitrogen is involved in almost every aspect of a plant's physiology, from protein synthesis to RNA, DNA, to all manner of enzymes and other constituents of a plant. There's nitrogen in there. So they need nitrogen. Manure. Animal manure is nitrogen rich. Okay? Compost. Let's think about compost. Is compost nitrogen rich? Yes. Depends. Okay. Thank you, Mona. But did you hear my friend back there? Depends. Depends. Sounds like he's a PhD. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it Michael? Okay, Michael. Depends. All right. Now you got to talk. Well, there's, there's usually like the, the CN ratio to the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Yeah, you're it's, getting complicated. Let's yeah. start at the very simplest. If it's a what do you think about the it's high in carbon and low in nitrogen? So let's get even simpler than that because he's getting into C to N ratio and some chemistry. Thank you, Michael. You're not wrong. But I'm going to go very simple plant based compost. If the compost is made from plant waste, coconut frond, husk, you know, uh, whatever is gathered in the, from landscapers and then dumped in a place in wind road, that typically low nitrogen compost. It's not a bad product if it's well composted. But it's not going to give you nitrogen. It will do other things. Make sense? However, Mona was was not wrong because she said 
When I said, is compost nitrogen rich? She said, yes. Well, if that compost was made with pigment, <laughs> it's nitrogen rich. What about like kitchen stuff, like leftover foods and things like that? Yes, think, yeah. yes, yes. It depends what you're using, right? And that you make sure that you compost it correctly. But it, so it depends the food stuff. What went into making that compost? Okay. Fish waste composting. Wow, the product is quite nitrogen rich. Okay. Now, a mantra in the organic farming community, whether you're in Poland, you're getting bored. Okay. Feed the soil. You've probably heard that before, right? Feed the soil. Oh, this sounds so cool, man. <laughs> Feed the soil. I love that. What are they talking about? Yeah, you need carbon so that you can build microbial function. But you're just feeding the soil. If you're adding plant-based composts that are not nitrogen rich, you're not addressing nutrient needs necessarily. You're addressing the other aspects of organic matter, water retention, microbial activity, soil structure, right? If you need nitrogen, the best approach, feed the soil with some compost or other kinds of organic matter, but always have some kind of nitrogen source at your disposal. And, and we have so many choices here. You know, we're not in Guinea where there's no choice. In fact, there's no nutrients. Everything is used. They, they, they use everything. You harvest a sorghum field in Guinea, the straw is used to make mats or feed the cattle. The grain is used to eat. Nothing gets returned to the soil. Can they go to the store and buy a ton of fertilizer? No. Can they get a ton of compost? No. Why can't they get a ton of compost? You got to make it. Everything they need to make the compost they're using for their house, to feed the animal, to, to do this or do that. Feed the soil if you can. Here we can go buy fish meal. Easy. Go down the store. I'm going to buy fish emulsion. Or I can buy blood meal. Go buy it. Why is blood meal a good fertilizer? It's nitrogen rich. 10% nitrogen. Wow. Blood meal. Where did it come from? Rendering plant. You know, they kill all those animals so that we can eat our chicken or pork chop. They take the blood and they render it, cook it, turn it into like powder. Good fertilizer. Better than throwing it in the landfill, right? We have a big grant to try help people here on this island to take animal waste from the slaughterhouse and turn it into fertilizer. We need to do that. We have to do that at the Veneta farm where they take cow waste from the butchery and they use it to grow the yeah. yeah. At what point do you reach nitrogen toxicity? Oh my, you have to add a lot. But yeah, you can. So we're going to get to that. Hold that question. You're right. It's, it's not the concept of more is always better, right? There's a range. What kind of crop are you growing? And what's your yield? What's what, how much do you want to grow? Are you just satisfied with enough for your family? Minimize. Okay. Okay. Here's something I think not many of us think about on a daily basis is that when we're thinking about farming, even at the home scale, you have to think about nutrients. Many of you people grow plants at home, right? Do you do something? You do something, I imagine. You don't have to. I have two orange trees and a lemon tree in my yard. I've never done anything to them. Not once. I just turn the water on every now and again because in Makaha, it's very dry. They produce oranges and lemons. I have so much, I got to take it down to the lifeguards. Hey, brother, here's some oranges or lemons yeah, for my neighbor. How come? I have a rich soil, and it's just one tree, two trees. What if I, was, if I was growing an acre of lemons and harvesting 
all the time. Some of my lemons fall down. I don't get every one, right? Okay. So, but you need to have some kind of nutrient. I grow arugula. I grow tatsoi. Lettuces. I don't grow tomatoes and all those things because the viruses come in. And I, I, don't know, I can't deal with that. For my arugula, if I just put the arugula in the soil and don't do anything, do I get much arugula? No. Not much. It grows a little bit. I get one cutting and then pow. Man, I like to cut my arugula like 20 times over a two-month period. What do I got to do? I got to get make sure there's nitrogen there. So before I plant the arugula, what do I do? I add fish meal. I do, I do or, um, uh, blood meal. I just go down to city mill. Boom, I buy a thing like, I don't have to add much, just a handful. Blah, done. I got to deal with my dog though, because guess what? My dog likes blood meal too. <laughs> no more arugula. So we got to think about things. We got to think about adding, because you, you want to grow something. For me, I don't sell it, but I eat it. That's an economy, right? I want to eat arugula. I'm not planting my bed out there to grow microbes. No, I don't eat microbes. Oh, Jonathan, what's the microbiome? So I could care less. I want to eat arugula. Mm. Ooh. Well, I used to add pig manure. I didn't go over too well with my neighbor. You know, Macaw is pretty dense. My my neighbor, hey, Tanti, what you doing again? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm growing my veggies. Man, it stinks so bad. <laughs> There's a social component. My use of pig manure is pissing off my neighbors because it smells bad for like four days. It smells really bad. I gotta be, I gotta have a social consciousness and say, okay, I won't use pig manure anymore. Blood meal doesn't smell bad. Think about on a, a larger scale. Now we coexist, right? Farms and neighborhoods. There's a so what I do on my land can affect the atmosphere, can affect the water, can affect uh, if soil leaves my land and ends up in the ocean. That's that's on me, right? So we have a social component we have to deal with. Are you doing the right thing? And then environmental, those are kind of tied together. Homeowners don't necessarily have to think at this level of complexity, but farmers do, right? Because they're on a larger scale. Your activity affects multiple layers of society and people. But a farm must be first and foremost profitable. Do you agree? My friend Jacqueline, she's oh, she's my good friend today. She's saying no. Okay, so the farm, the 10-acre farm, not making money. The farmer's got to pay the, 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 the lease on the land. Okay, the farmer got to pay. He invested or she invested in the new tractor because they, they, you know, 15 and 10 acres. Are, okay, they, they got payments to make on that tractor. The farmer got to pay the water bill. Like, you see where I'm going? Okay, now if they're not growing enough, they can't pay their bills. So according to you then, oh, well, Uncle Sam will do it for you. I'm okay with that, but that's not gonna work, is it? Now, homeowners, <laughs> it's a different deal, right? They don't need to think about it. But you can see farming is not so straightforward. There are many, many levels to, to being a successful farmer. And they have to contend with these daily, these decisions. Do I spray my watermelon crop or not? Well, if they use a pesticide, there's a cost to that, right? Environmental costs. If they don't take care of that pest, they don't harvest any watermelon. Okay, switch crops. Don't grow watermelon. Okay, good, good, good. Keep going. So, in terms of fertilizer, all of us, even homeowners, should consider these things source, how much, what you're adding, how much you're adding, when you're adding it, and where you're putting it. So, this comes to my friend um, David, who said, Well, too much nitrogen, 
could be toxic. Absolutely. So you need to know what are you adding and then how much are you adding. Okay. okay. These seem like pretty straightforward questions, right? But they're they're involved. They're things. We have all kinds of fertilizers. You can look them up. Organic fertilizers, conventional fertilizers, compost teas, microbial inoculants, uh, snake oils from I don't know who. You can get anything. People can make up a concoction and tell you it's going to grow you the, the best whatever. Yeah, please. What is feathering? Feathering. This is a common fertilizer for organic farmers, commercial organic farmers. You know, people who are growing 50 acres of lettuce, but organic. Feather meal is all of the waste, the feather waste from a chicken operation. You know, they kill chickens, they process it, and they got a lot of feathers. Feathers are protein rich. Lots of nitrogen in feathers. Lots. It's an excellent fertilizer, actually. Wow. Very good fertilizer. You can buy it. It's not cheap. We were trying to get some farmers to switch their chemical fertilizer with feather meal, but it costs three times more. Is that gonna work? No. Okay, all kinds of things. Rock phosphate, okay? Some of you will get calls and they'll say, I'm an organic, I wanna be pure organic and I wanna add rock phosphate, yeah? Okay, first question you have to ask them is, well, what's the pH of your soil? And the, the, the homeowner says, well, my soil is 6.5. Okay, for rock phosphate to work, the soil has to have a pH of 5.5 or less. If you add rock phosphate to a soil with pH 6, 6.5, the rock phosphate does not dissolve. If the rock phosphate does not dissolve, no phosphate can go in the plant, right? Because it's a rock. Make sense? These are the kinds of questions that you, eventually you're gonna be really good at this. Yeah. So what can you add? You got many choices. High nitrogen materials, organic, let's review that. Nitrogen is an important thing. What are, what are good nitrogen sources, organic? I don't wanna use chemical fertilizer. Pig manure. Horse. Not horse manure. No. Horse yeah. manure. Low quality. Urine. Urine. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, for a while, I was storing my urine. And my wife went out, and she lifted up this barrel, and she's like, Jonathan, what? What is this? Well, yeah, that's my fertilizer. What? So I, I would take one part urine, three, four parts water, mix it, put it in my vegetable garden. Well, that ended. <laughs> Chicken manure, feather meal, Rabbit. blood meal. Rabbit manure is okay. It's not great. It's okay. Rabbits don't make much manure, so it's, it's, there's not much there. Cow manure. Cow manure is not high nitrogen, but it's a good product. You just got to add more of it. Cow manure is low nitrogen. So pig manure is better. Than pig manure is good. Yeah. It's better than it's yeah, it's hard to get. Unless you're, you live by somebody, you know, I used to be able to go get bags of pig manure from the farms in Wyandotte until my neighbor said, no, no, you can't do that. How would you huh? make vermicast? Oh, vermicast. Yes, you know the vermicompost? Nitrogen rich. But for homeowner, that's good because you don't need, you know, you can't make too much of it. A lot of people have chickens around here. How do you rate chicken manure versus pig manure? Oh, equal. Good. Chicken depends on chicken and pig manure. Ah, uh, it depends. Depends on nitrogen content, but they're both good. Both. So goat manure. Not so good. They don't. Yeah. I didn't know that you were Go ahead and finish. No, no. I, I just say goat manure is not great. It's all right. That's one. Oh, really good. Really good. Bad guano is one of the top. You know, before they had um, before they had industrial fertilizer plants. The Germans were sailing to uh, the Western Pacific to harvest bat guano. 
and sell it as fertilizer. They sold it. That was the first fertilizers used here in Hawaii on the plantations, bat guano. True. But so you're saying plant-based, though, is like perennial peas are known to put a little bit, but very low. Yeah, it's pretty low. Not human waste. Oh, very good. <laughs> but you got to treat it. You got to process it. Because there's the path, you know, you can't just throw it out there. The urine... I was, that I was using is not dangerous because I was not putting it on the leaves. But my wife said, you know, this is not. The neighbors are going to really go after us now. Fish meal. Fish meal. Yes. Okay, very quickly. Well, I already said that, sorry. What about horse manure and sheep? Um, those aren't very high in the bee compost. Is it because of that? So you can use horse manure composted as the compost. It's good for the soil, but it won't give you much nitrogen. Same with that. Same with that. Yeah, for good, good organic matter source. Okay, how much do you add? Well, this is a whole science, right? You've got to look at how much is in the soil already, how much does the plant need, will allow you to decide how much to add. Here's a typical response curve. If your soil is really low in phosphorus, let's say, Okay, you're down here. You're getting poor growth, right? Plant's not growing well. Okay, I'm going to add some phosphorus fertilizer. It could be in the form of manure. I add a little bit. The soil phosphorus level goes up a little bit. I get a better yield. I add some more. It goes up even more. I add some more. I reach a plateau. What does this tell us? Stop wasting. Stop. Stop adding. Stop adding. Now, homeowners aren't going to do soil tests like this. Farmer, a commercial farmer. So, you know, we can do some back to the envelope cal calculations. We're probably not going to do that for master gardener. If they're asking about how much to add, you might get some input from your extension. Because you don't want to say something that you don't know. And we don't have time to go through all the calculations. Make sense? Good. But, there is a science behind how much to add. There is a science. It's well developed. Summer. Yeah. And manure. <laughs> well, no, no. My first thing, my first thing is, you, you folks familiar with his book, Nana Ikekumu? Na na ike kumu. Yeah, look, absolutely. look to the source. Look to the source. Kumu is source. Kumu is also teacher. Remember, Hawaiian words can have many meanings depending on how and where they're placed. Na na ike kumu. This is a picture of mid elevation kohala. What did we learn about the soils in mid elevation kohala? It's brutal. I told you they're the best soils in the world, and Jacqueline said, no, they're not. <laughs> I'm kidding. She said, Uganda. And I said, right on. So there's a long history of how land was used. Find out that first. What happened on your land? Yeah. What do people do there? Is it former sugar land? Is it former pasture land? Was it a dump? Was it this? Was it that? Look to the source. Ah, oh, what am I doing? Yes, yes, yes. That's all. Organic matter makes a difference. Okay? So, as you leave today, you now have a little bit of an ability to say, I expect this kind of soil at this location. Do we all have that? If we have that, then I think we're in good shape. We can study soils for our whole life and still not know much. We'll know something. Mahalo. Any questions? In the slide you have with the hands, yeah. on the chemical process, the third point was buffer. Yeah. What is that? What is the chemical process? So uh, everybody understands the concept of buffering is ma maintaining stability so that you don't have wild fluctuations. 
That's buffering, right? Soils like, it's good for soils to be buffered. You don't want soils today to have a pH of six, tomorrow have a pH of eight, the next day have a pH of four. You don't want that. Water is unbuffered. Water. If you add a, just a tiny little drop of vinegar to water, what happens? Lowers the pH. pH goes way down. You add a little tiny drop of bicarbonate, it comes back up. It changes really quick. Organic matter and clay buffer soil. Yeah, it keeps the soil stable. So it's not wildly fluctuating in nutrient status and pH in water. Remember, because um, uh, organic matter has a high water retention capacity. So it will keep that soil buffered in terms of water moisture status for, for longer time than if you have less organic matter. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, just repeat the question. So focus on my here. Yeah, sorry, Jonathan. And no, they can hear you. We're, OK, we're, the question was, Buffering capacity. You mentioned that in terms of organic matter. And my answer was keep a soil stable. Organic matter stabilizes soil chemical processes. Thanks. Yeah. Is arsenic a problem in old sugarcane land? And if so, what, what should be done about it? Yeah, good question. Um, yes, the answer is yes, depending where you are. Not all former sugarcane lands are. Uh, arsenic, you know, toxic, but certain areas, especially outside around Hilo, um, and where there was heavy use of a certain herbicide way back in the day, lead arsenate. Uh, the only way to know if you have an arsenic problem is to get a soil test. And I think nowadays the only people who can give you a result, you have to send it to the mainland. And the test will be expensive, $300 or more. Yeah, and you have to ask, and you have to ask for bioavailable arsenic, not total arsenic, because that those are two very different. So you have to ask bioavailable arsenic, and then they'll do the test and they'll tell you whether there's a problem or not. You know, if that was a problem, then how about? Okay. You know, I don't have the, all of that in the head. Um, I can't say there are certain areas where. But it's it's not really widespread. It's not everywhere. You can't say, oh, this was former sugarcane. I automatically have an arsenic problem. No, you got to test for it. They're right in treatment. Arsenic is tough. Arsenic is tough because it's the the thing about arsenic is as long as you're not ingesting that soil, either the dust or you know through your mouth, it's not a problem because it's bound to the clay. It's not leaching, it's not entering the atmosphere. So, and it's not going into plants. It's not. There are certain plants. I must say that, that ferns. Yeah, but, but we don't eat, but we don't eat those ferns. No, we do. The oil? Yeah, but oil is not grown on former sugar cane land. I don't think. It does. Well, then in that case, if you're growing a fern that is known to take arsenic, you better do an arsenic test on your soil. Yeah, it doesn't. Well, you know, they're available. They're available. This plant that will take up that arsenic. Besides ferns, what are some of the other plants? Oh, I don't, I'm not an expert in Sunflower, arsenic. Sunflowers, decorative cabbage, and the ornamental cabbage, which is a I had to look that up and they took a flip. So I, uh, we have a garden by Lola. We were going to do a food garden and test it because of the sugar cane. The, the lead levels of the arsenic were too high. Was it bioavailable arsenic? You have to, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was pretty. It was, no, no, the test. Bio. Yeah. You have to do a specific oh, test. So whatever they do here. <laughs> oh, well, if it was done by the UH, don't, don't believe it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. It was the wrong test. Send it. No, I'm serious. It has to get sent to an EPA approved lab. Okay. And you have to ask them. Well, it's not me, it's the state doing the test. Right. So you have to you have to specifically say bioavailable arsenic because if you just say arsenic, they'll take a total arsenic measurement. Yeah, we can talk about that. 
but it's 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 an important thing, very important. Uh, I know we're keep uh, burning. So whatever the grass is a firm on the line. Is that a good idea? Or is that a Continuous burning, like when you say whenever possible, because no, that's not a pharmacola is very hard to set fire, but uh, it's very hard to control the glass. Yeah, I mean, you know. I would not recommend that as a, as a good practice. It's, that's a lot of carbon dioxide and air quality issues that you're putting up. It used to be a practice of, of Native Hawaiians. They would clear land with fire, but they were good at it. And we're in a different time. I, my personal recommendation is find another way to control. Yeah, it's, I know it's a challenge. But I I don't think burning is is the first choice. Question, Jonathan: What do you think about coffee grounds for um, for uh, compost or yeah. for green manure? Yeah, I mean, mix it with a carbon source. You got to have a carbon. You can't just have coffee grounds by themselves. Mixed in with some carbon wood chips or. So would you say the ratio of seventy percent nitrogen and eighty percent carbon for making compost is a good one? You know. I'm not a compost making expert. My rule of thumb, and I've made good compost at home, is one third, one third, one third. And would you also say that anything that was once alive can be composted? Could you repeat the question? So the question was when you make compost, what is the ratio of carbon to nitrogen? And me, I always go one third brown wood chips, brown leaves, one third green leaves, and one third manure. Or two thirds brown and one third fish meat. There are many recipes. That's another one for empty Google. <laughs> All kinds. You know, at home, I just do it as a backyard guy. Boom. You know, and I'm not very consistent. Some years I don't make it. I'm lazy. I'd rather go surfing. <laughs> when my day off, I'm not going to make compost. I'm going to go catch 10 foot macaw. <laughs> Jonathan, can I say something here? And there's a carbon nitrogen calculators, right? That's going to be uh, an available supplemental materials for the organic and cover crops class. So there's this carbon and nitrogen calculator that you can use with general materials that you can try to put in how much you're putting in of each of that. And that'll give you a ratio of C to N. Right. So if you know that C to N ratio that you want to use, depending on who you're talking to, they're going to tell you something different for C to N, right? I say 25 to 1. Um, but others will say other things. Yeah, I think it's important. I don't think it's so important to get some exact ratio. Make sure you've got carbon and nitrogen and more carbon than nitrogen for sure. The more important thing where composting fails, at least at the backyards, is mismanagement of water. It's either too wet or too yeah. dry. And then it doesn't matter. All the thought you put into carbon to nitrogen ratio, it doesn't matter. Even if your carbon to nitrogen ratio is off and you maintain the right water content and aeration, that will compost. It will compost. Yeah. I have one final quick question. If I wanted to buy the Rolls Royce of soil testing kits, do you have something that you could recommend? Lamar. Lamont. Lamont. L A M O T T E, but you're going to pay $2,000. Right. So don't do it. <laughs> what would be good for the trainer? What would be good for the trainer? Well, I think pH is really, you know, because even if you're able to do a soil test and you get a value, you, you might not have the right decision-making capability to interpret that number. It takes, it takes some training. You know, if, if that's important, then, then a training should be designed for soil testing using these, these, these kits from people like us. We have extension agents who could run a, a, a week-long class. It would take at least a week. 
Oh no, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Only yeah, if I call it the or I go work in Africa, but not here. To me, what would my mom's? <laughs> but in Guinea and, and, and places where they don't have infrastructure, I will invest a month long training in rural parts of Myanmar. Yes. Ooh, that was a long morning, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.